Have you ever wondered how websites know exactly what you talked about a few hours ago? Are they watching your every move? Well, in a way, yes. They suggest products to buy, analyze their competitors, and monitor their brand's reputation. Big shots like Amazon, eBay, Twitter, Instagram, and even your new favorite, ChatGPT, are all into web scraping. They're using this trick to make their products even better if not the absolute best. But hey, why should you care? Well, imagine truly understanding how all of this works under the hood and using it to your advantage. Picture yourself creating software that monitors the actions of platforms like Amazon, notifying your users precisely when it's the optimal moment to make a purchase. You wouldn't only develop software that wows future employers, but a handy tool that saves you money. That's exactly what we'll do in this video in the JavaScript mastery style. You'll learn what web scraping really is and then build a tool to leverage it. Who knows, one of you might even take it to the next level and turn it into a software as a service business that others would want to use and pay for. Even Mr. Beast scrapes the web. We just paid someone to sit there and refresh and then book it for when it came out. <laughs> wow. So like someone would cancel six months out, yes. ours. But hey, there has to be a better way to do it, right? We're developers. We can surely figure out a more efficient solution. What about a programmed scraping bot that can jump over all the most common obstacles developers face while scraping, such as handling CAPTCHAs, anti-scraping measures, IP rotation, and anything else that may require human intervention. Unless most developers out there, you will know how to build it. So let's dive into the world of web scraping so I can tell you more about website crawlers, what libraries you need to build a web scraper, and how to do scraping in the smartest way possible. And immediately after, develop a Next.js 13 scraping app that easily leaps over all the mentioned scraping obstacles. An application that perfectly combines two best concepts, Next.js and scraping. With a simple yet sweet landing page showcasing a nice header with a carousel, a search bar for scraping the products, and a section showing so far scraped products. All we need is to provide an Amazon product link and behind the scenes, we'll scrape the details, such as product image, product price, and a special section that we calculate showcasing the average, highest, and lowest price that this item has reached so far. Then there's a detailed section showing product descriptions scraped from Amazon, and finally, a section displaying similar scraped products to discover. But there's more than what meets the eye. We'll implement a special track option, a modal where you can provide your email address and then it'll track that product for you. First, it'll send a welcome email showing how the future's emails will look like. For example, if a product that wasn't available is now back in stock, this application will send you an email to notify you the moment it's back. And many more use cases, such as notifying you when the product reaches its lowest price ever. And will this process be manual? Well, not at all. We'll use a special programming technique called cron. It's a special technique that runs the programs automatically at specified intervals. Imagine a cron job is like a magical timer for your computer. You can tell this timer, hey, do something for me at specific time every day. For example, you can say at eight o'clock in the morning, I want you to open up my favorite game. The timer will remember that and make sure to open your game every day at 8 a.m., just like magic. It's like having a little helper who does things for you automatically when you want them to, without having to do it yourself. Cool, right? And that's exactly what I will teach you, to trigger our scraper on a periodic basis so we'll keep our application up to date with recent data coming from the original Amazon website. And then, depending on the conditions, we'll send emails to the user. I hope that sounds exciting, as these things are rarely thought on YouTube. And we are about to explore all of them and combine them into a functional application. So without any further ado, let's get started with the first part of this video, which is what's web scraping in the first place. If anything is going to play a significant role in this era and beyond, it is data. Photos you share on Instagram, tweets, 
and even this video you're watching right now are all data. Having access to large amounts of data is powerful. It is this very data that OpenAI and MidJourney used to train their models, and we all know how impressive the results are. As the amount of data grew really fast, smart people saw an opportunity to use it to make their businesses better, and quickly, web scraping came into the picture. Have you ever copied stuff from a website and written it down somewhere, like on a piece of paper, or like in a text file or Excel? Well, you've just scraped the web. Web scraping means taking information or data from websites, but instead of doing it yourself, we make programs to do it automatically. So think of web scraping as grabbing useful info from other websites without directly taking their permission to do so. We do this to help with all sorts of things, like creating new products, automations, or even checking what our competitors are up to. Currently, many big organizations scrape data in various formats, from images, videos, text, to reviews and pricing. So when you look something online, like wanting to buy a fancy MacBook M2, you'll see suggestions from different websites right at the top. And if you click that shopping button at the top, you'll see the complete list with different filters. That's Google Shopping. Google collects details from online shops only to show them to their Google Shopping page. Companies like Google or OpenAI are scraping the data available on other sites to build their amazing products. What's ChatGPT anyway? A wild wizard that went around grabbing all the public data it could find? To answer this question, let's first clarify the difference between a web scraper and a web crawler. Although the main functionality of extracting information is the same for both, they slightly differ in their process. Web crawlers generally navigate the web, and web scrapers extract specific data from the pages. Web crawlers follow all the links to discover new pages, but web scrapers target specific pages for data extraction. Usage is much different. Crawlers are mostly related to SEO analysis, and web scrapers can scrape absolutely any piece of data. In the recent world, it has been mostly used for data set generation for machine learning training. So, as you can see, web crawler is what Google or other browsers use to index websites. They too navigate through our whole website first, find links, and rank them accordingly. But on the other hand, scraping targets specific types of websites on their page. It's more about focusing on what truly matters. But with that in mind, how do web scrapers truly work? It all starts with sending an HTTP request. We send requests to websites we want to scrape. This process is automatic. It's not like you sit the whole day pressing a button to make requests. Our code will do it on its own. Next, we get a reply to our scraper's request with the website's content. This content usually includes things like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript pages. As we receive all the content, we need to go through the process of parsing and carefully selecting the specific things that matter to us. If we're doing a price comparison, we're interested in the product and its price details. But how do we actually do the parsing? Well, after we get a response from a website, it's most likely going to include an HTML page. And let's say you want to extract price from a product page. We have to directly pinpoint the element that holds the price information. For instance, you inspect the price of a product on an Amazon website. You'll notice it's located within a specific type of element called a span element, which is identified by a unique class named like a price hole. Of course, it can be different for different websites. That's the goal here. We'll focus on this specific element to retrieve our desired data, whether it's the title, pricing, or any other information from this page. Once we've parsed the content, we extract only the data we're interested in. And lastly, you write the necessary code and store the extracted data in your database. Use it for training machine learning models or building new apps. I hope that by now you have just a bit of a better understanding of the typical scraping process. But now let me teach you how to create web scrapers.
Is there a ton of code that we have to write? Well, not at all. People often think web scraping is something that takes a lot of work to build. Most of the time, it's only about focusing on business logic, which means figuring out what kind of data you want and where you want to get it from. Some smart minds have already created amazing open source scrapers we can install, call, and we're good to go with. One of the most popular scrapers is Puppeteer. Right now, you're most likely watching this video through a browser. A browser that has a user interface you can interact with. This is called a headful browser. On the contrary, the headless browser doesn't have a graphical user interface, or GUI for short. It has no visual interface like the traditional browsers we use daily. It runs in the background and allows us to do automated web actions programmatically without displaying the web page on the screen. Developed by Google, it's one of the top choices for many developers who do web scraping. And here's a quick example of how we can use it. First, you import required modules. Then you create an express app, define a route to handle web scraping, launch a headless browser using Puppeteer, open up a new browser page, navigate to the Amazon product page, extract all information from the page, close the browser, and send the scraped data as a JSON response. There are also other tools like Cheerio that help us parse the HTML content more easily. And Cheerio can be paired with other scraping tools. For example, with Puppeteer. Import required modules. Create an express app. Define a route to handle scraping. Launch a headless browser using Puppeteer. Open up a new page. Navigate to the Amazon product page. Get the HTML content. Load the content into Cheerio. Extract information from the page using Cheerio selectors, which is much simpler than doing it manually. And then close the browser and send the scraped data as a JSON response. Although the difference with and without Cheerio may not be noticeable right now, once you build something big like what we'll do today, you'll immediately notice how useful it is. Sounds simple so far? Well, here's where things get a bit more complicated. There are many web scraping obstacles. It's not us trying to make these requests, but the code we wrote. Designed to act like a human, but still, it's not. The websites we scrape can understand who's using their site. And if they notice something fishy, they'll immediately block your IP. Web scraping is all about imitating a human and working on their behalf. It has to simulate the behavior of a real human being. For that reason, you may have seen some CAPTCHAs like solving puzzles and identifying objects and images. They've gotten pretty crazy lately, requesting us to do all sorts of things to prove we're human. Websites use CAPTCHAs to prevent automated bots and scrapers from accessing their content. So if you're a human being watching this video, like it and comment down below on how you like these videos that start with a crash course and then advance into a build and deploy. I'm always searching for new ways to provide you with the best content possible. In your opinion, truly means a lot to me. The second way websites block you is by doing IP blocking and rate limiting. If you send too many requests, you're done. The third obstacle we face is dynamic content. As web developers, we build websites using React that loads the content after the initial page load. We send minimal HTML and execute our JavaScript code based on the conditions. Traditional scrapers might struggle to capture this dynamic content. You might be reminded of the headless browsers we just discussed. Although these headless browsers are great, they still can't crack a few of these problems. So where do they fail? Well, all of the obstacles we talked about, from handling JavaScript-heavy pages, CAPTCHAs, anti-scraping measures, user interactions like searching something before extracting data from a page, device detection, complex navigations, IP rotation, managing requests, legal concerns, and literally anything that may require human intervention while scraping. The name? Bright Data. Being rated as one of the top most voted for web scraping, Bright Data kind of does it. No, they haven't hired an army of people to do the job. Instead, 
they've engineered a headful browser termed Scraping Browser, which will do the things as if a human is actually using the website. It almost completely imitates a human. And IP rotation, it does it automatically. So the creator of any website will never know who is using their website. It can be you or another Bright Data service. No one will know. And that's exactly the reason we'll use Bright Data in our project to build a project without worrying of any above obstacles. Don't trust me blindly. Here are a few examples to show you why we'll use Bright Data. From big companies, including Upwork, everyone out there is recommending Bright Data if you really want to build a proper web scraping project. And the scraping browser isn't the only feature Bright Data has to offer. They go beyond that by providing big companies' datasets with a unique web unlocker feature, a way to getting unblocked. It's going to help you overcome any website blocks with its AI automated features. And the best thing is, we'll use this same amazing feature to scrape the data from Amazon websites in a couple of seconds within the app you are about to build. So without any further ado, I hope you learned a lot about why scraping is important, how to do it, what the obstacles are, and now you are going to build your own unblockable web scraping tool using Bright Data. To get started building our phenomenal price tracker application, we can start as we usually do by creating a new empty folder on our desktop. We're starting from scratch and let's call it price wise. Then open up an empty Visual Studio Code window and simply drag and drop that folder in. After which you can go full screen or half screen, go to the top left, view, and then terminal. This is going to open up a built-in Visual Studio Code terminal. Once you have it, we can initialize our Next.js application. And Next.js 13 is the React framework for the web. It is used by some of the world's largest companies, enables you to create full stack web applications by extending the latest React features and integrating powerful Rust-based JavaScript tooling for the fastest builds. So let's go ahead and click Get Started. Immediately right here, you can read more through the Next.js documentation and learning about most important features such as routing, rendering, data fetching, and more. And then you can go to the installation process where we can follow the documentation to install it. I would never want you to just go ahead and type out the commands without knowing why or how I got to them in the first place. So that's why I want to refer to the documentation whenever we're doing something. And that's the exact premise behind our ultimate Next.js 13 course. If you haven't already, go to jsmastery.pro forward slash next 13. And here you can see why many of these companies are developing their applications in Next.js and how we can join them in doing so while understanding all of these concepts we've seen within the documentation and more. So if you're interested in learning Next, which I'm sure you are because you're watching this video, you're gonna love what we do within the Next.js course, turning this into something like this. So let's get started with the installation of our project by copying this command right here, going back within our app, pasting it, and then just saying dot slash to create it in the current repository we're in. Once you do that, you can press Y to install the package that's going to install our app. And then you can answer a couple of questions. In this case, we do want to use TypeScript, so we can say yes. For ESLint, I'm going to say no, just so we have a simpler installation process. For Tailwind CSS, we're going to say yes. No source directory. App router, definitely. We don't need to customize the import alias. And that's it. I was mostly pressing just enter to go with the default options. So now let's wait until the dependencies have been installed. And then we can start developing our application and the initial file and folder structure. And there we go. Success created price-wise at desktop right here. I'm going to clear my terminal and I'm going to immediately run npm run dev, which is going to open up our app on localhost 3000. Once it runs it, you can simply press control click to open it up in the browser and you'll be greeted with this great Next.js starter screen. So let's drag and drop that all the way to the left. And that's going to allow us to have enough space for the development of our application while at the same time looking at the deployed site. 
Let's close our terminal and let's start looking into the base file and folder structure. So first of all, here we're gonna have the app. And within the app, we have our home, but we don't need any of these. So you can simply just remove everything and run RAFCE. This is going to create a base React arrow function component and something known as page, but we can rename it to home. There we go. So this is our home page, and now you can see just home. If RAFCE didn't work for you, that must mean that you don't have the ES7 Plus React Redux React Native snippets installed. So just install this extension and it should work immediately. Great. So with that said, now we have our page, but we do have some weird lines appearing right here. That's because our globals.css is applying some weird styles. So what you can do is go to the description of this video, and there you're gonna find a GitHub gist with the modified globals.css file. So simply copy it and paste it over here. If you save it and reload the page, you're gonna notice that we're missing the font enter. And this font will have to be applied as a custom class within our Tailwind config. So in that same GitHub gist, you'll find a modified tailwind.config.ts, which you can simply override right here. Once you do that, you're gonna notice that here, we keep almost everything the same, but we do change a couple of primary colors just so we have a consistent application coloring. And we also add the font family of Inter. So another thing we need to do is we need to head into the layout.tsx. And this is where you actually import fonts from Google or elsewhere. So alongside importing Inter, what we can also do is we can also get the space grotesque like this. And we're gonna define Inter as a subset of Latin. And we're gonna also define another font right here by saying const space grotesque. And that's gonna be equal to space underscore grotesque where we define a subsets of Latin like so. Then we can also add different kinds of weights right, right here by saying weights, which is going to be an array of 300. And I believe those have to be strings. So 300, we're gonna also have 400, 500, 600, and 700. So we wanna go really bold. And we can see that our TypeScript is complaining right here. It is going to be just weight not weights. So immediately you can see how useful it is to have TypeScript have your back. And with that, everything works. We're back on home and we don't have those weird lines because we have modified the globals.css and the tailwind.config.ts files. Now bear with me, we didn't do any additional crazy styling here. We've just done the setup. Same thing for the global CSS. So here we have some often used cards, which we're gonna apply, which apply a couple of different basic styles from Tailwind. But the majority of the styling of this application will still be done exactly by you by following this tutorial. So you don't have to worry about that. This is just the setup to make our life easier in the long run. Now that we're on our home, let's also modify our layout. So in the layout, we do import globals.css, we import the metadata, and finally we import the inter and space grotesque font, which we define right here. After that, we have our metadata where you can change your application's title. Ours is going to be called price-wise. And you can add a description where you can say something like track product prices effortlessly and save money on your online shopping, which is exactly what our app does. And it's really cool that you can immediately just change the title and the description right here, which is going to modify your SEO metadata. Now, after that, here we have our body and we have our main inside of which we have our children. But here, we also wanna add a nav bar because we want our nav bar to appear everywhere. So let's wrap our children in a main tag and put it right here within it Let's give this main a class name of max-w-10xl. So this is going to be a max width of 1440p. We always want to have a specific max width, even if a user has an extra ultra large monitor, that Samsung Odyssey thing that goes all the way around you. Still, they cannot read the text if it spans more than, let's say, 1000 pixels or 1440p. So we wanna just provide a max width on the entire container. And we can also define a margin X 
meaning marginal left and right, to auto. And now this allows us to create our first component, which is going to be called navbar. So here we can define a self-closing navbar component. We can then go into our, not app, but we're going to go outside of it and we're going to create a new folder called components. Within components, we can create a new file called navbar.tsx. And there we can run RAFCE to quickly spin up our navbar. Now, if we go there, you can simply double click the navbar and press control space or command space if you're in Mac. And this is going to automatically add the import from add forward slash components forward slash navbar. So if you do that, now we can see the navbar and you can see the home as well, which is great. Now, since we're doing this in the layout, which is a special Next.js file, again, more on that in the Next.js course that we're doing, essentially what layout is doing, let me find it in the docs, layout is going to allow you to share different parts of the application across different pages. The navbar is the best example of doing so. You can define a layout by default exporting a React component from a layout.js file. And then you can add a navigation bar like we did right now. So now we are right here where we have the navbar and the home. We're done with our layout file. We can do the navbar later on and we can do the page later on. But let's quickly look into the rest of our files that we have in our application. So right here, we have the app and within the app, we have our favicon. For now, this is just a regular Vercel logo, but we want to update it. So what we can do is in that same GitHub gist down below, you'll find a link to a zipped public folder. Simply download it, unzip it, and then delete this current public logo and just paste the new one right here in the root of your directory. There, you'll be able to find some assets such as icons we're going to use in this application. Also some images, which we're going to use such as the hero images and more. And finally, you'll be able to find a new favicon.ico, which you can simply drag and drop to the app and then replace it right here. That way, if you now reload the application, you'll be able to see this little fire with a discount on top, which is the logo of our application. Sometimes it's not going to update automatically. So you have to do control shift R, which is essentially a hard reload, but sooner or later it's going to update. So now we know everything that's within our app. We have the favicon globals layout and page within the components. We'll be adding more components. Then we have the node modules for all of our packages. We have the public with the assets, images, and icons. We have a git ignore as we don't want to push everything to GitHub, especially not our dependencies. And with that said, we can get started with developing our navbar. Our navbar is going to use a semantic HTML5 header tag. And within it, we also want to use a nav tag. This way, all devices that need accessibility know that this is indeed a navigation bar. Our header is going to have a class name equal to w-full. And this is going to provide it a width of 100%. If this syntax seems weird to you, that's because maybe you haven't heard of Tailwind. And if that is the case, you definitely should learn more about it. Essentially, by adding utility classes, you're writing a real CSS, but much faster while still keeping the entire customization flexibility, but just allowing for a much faster workflow. So while going through this video, if any of the classes I write are unclear to you, you can just go here and just search. So if I go for w-full, you'll be able to see that it is indeed a width. And here you can see what that property does. If it's still unclear to you, I would recommend installing the Tailwind IntelliSense package, which is this one right here. And what that's going to do is if you hover over it, it's going to give you the exact CSS properties of the that utility class applies. Great. So let's also add another class name to our nav, which is going to say nav. This is not a Tailwind CSS class. This is one of the classes we added within our initial styles. So if you search for nav, you should be able to find it within our globals.css, which essentially just applies a few more Tailwind classes. So if sometimes you're not sure what this does, you can just go to search, search the class name, find it, and then apply it. Great. So now we can see that we 
cannot see anything, but that's because we don't have any content. So within our nav, we of course want to add a link. And this is going to be a link coming from next forward slash link. So you can automatically import it right here at the top and give it an href equal to forward slash, meaning it's going to point to home. We can give it a class name equal to flex item slash center and then gap of one to provide some spacing between the elements. Then that link can also render an image. This image is of course also an optimized next forward slash image. So we need to import it at the top and then give it a source property equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash logo dot SVG. If you save it, it's immediately going to be visible. Or at least when you give it a width property of 27 and a height property of 27 as well, and then an alt tag equal to logo. If you save that, you can see our logo appear on top as it does on the final website. But now let's add the second part of this, which is going to be the P tag. This P tag is going to have a class name equal to nav dash logo. And we can also say price and then create a span element, give it a class name of text dash primary. So now we're using this primary color and then we can simply say wise. So this is going to be price wise and you can see it nicely right here. The next thing we want to do within our navigation bar is if we go to below the link, render a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex. So the items appear in a row, items dash center and gap of five. Within here, we can loop over the elements we want to show. So that's going to be search, heart, and then profile. So we can do that by declaring them right here at the top by saying const nav icons is equal to an array where we have a couple of objects. The first one is going to say source forward slash assets forward slash icons forward slash search dot SVG. And we can also give it an alt tag equal to search. We can duplicate this two more times. The second one is going to be a black heart dot SVG and it's going to say heart. The third one is going to be user and it's going to say user. What this allows us to do is now simply open up a new dynamic block of code and say nav icons dot map where we immediately get a specific icon we want to map over. And then you can immediately return something and that something is going to be a self-closing image that's just going to have a key equal to icon.alt because we're mapping over it. It's going to have a source equal to icon.source. It's going to have an alt tag equal to icon.alt. And it's going to have a width of 28, a height of 28 as well, and a class name equal to object-contain. If I now save this, you can see three icons appear. And if we didn't have this array of icons, then we would have to do all of that here manually. And we would have to display three different images, which you never want to do if you can make it dynamic. And with that said, believe it or not, this is it for our simple nav bar. This now allows us to much better focus on what is yet to come, which is the main part of our application, the homepage. So now we can exit the nav bar and go into our app and then page, which is our primary home component. So let's do that next. To get started with our home, we can start with the UI and the UX of the home, meaning what we can visually see on the screen before we start implementing the functionality. So with that said, we're going to wrap everything in an empty React fragment, which allows us to add more elements within it. And then first, we're going to wrap the first part within a section HTML5 component. This section is going to have a class name equal to padding X of six. And just to be able to visually see it, I'm going to add a border of two and a border red 500. Now you should be able to see how this component behaves. Right now, it's just a line, but on medium devices, we can give it a padding X of 20 and a padding Y of 24, and that's going to make it expand to form this section. 
within this section, we can create another div. And this div is going to have a class name equal to flex max-xl flex-call. So on max Excel devices, which means with a min width of 1,280 pixels, it's going to be a column. So it's going to display more so in a tablet way, like so. Um, and then we can give it a gap of 16. Great. So within this div, we're going to create another div. And this one is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and justify dash center. Finally, within it, we can start creating our layout. So right here, we can create a P tag that's going to have a class name equal to small dash text. And it's simply going to say smart shopping starts here. Okay, that's nice. And then we can render an image tag, which we of course have to import coming from next forward slash image at the top. And we can give it a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash arrow dash right dot SVG. Give it the alt tag of arrow right and a width of 16, as well as a height of 16. And now if you save it, you can see smart shopping starts here and we're starting to replicate what we have on the deployed application. But of course, this primary H1, as well as the paragraph here in the search bar, is what's going to make our app pop. So let's head below this B tag, and let's implement an H1 tag that's going to have a class name equal to head-text. Here, we can say unleash the power of and then we can go to a new line and enter a span element with a class name of primary. And there we can say price wise, just like so, but by giving it an extra space within. There we go. Unleash the power of price wise. And of course, we want to do this primary or rather text dash primary, which is going to actually color it in our primary color. I got to say red is a bold color to choose, but in this case, we're cutting the prices. So we want to be really bold with our coloring and design as well. Now below this H1, we want to have another P tag that's going to have a class name equal to MT of six. So margin top of six to divide it a bit from the top. And then within it, we want to just copy what we have on the deployed site. And as a matter of fact, I would want you to have this site opened as well. So you can go to pricewise 10vercelapp and you can copy this description from here and paste it here. Essentially, it's going to say powerful, self-serve product and growth analytics to help you convert, engage, and retain more. Finally, below this, we will want to render a new component, which is going to be called search bar. For now, we can simply return this as a regular text element, but soon enough, we're going to turn this into a special component. Now, we want to go below this div, and here, we want to display a hero carousel. A hero is usually a component that's being displayed on the home page, such as this entire part. And then a carousel is this carousel that moves around many different images. So this is going to be converted into its own component really soon as well. With that said, let's go down below this div and below the section, and we can create a second section. This section is going to have a class name equal to trending dash section. And we're going to render an H2 within it. And this H2 is simply going to say trending. And it's going to have a class name equal to section dash text. So now we can see trending. And of course, this is going to portray our second part of the application where we can see the products that we want to get the discounts and prices for. And finally, within it, we can create a new div. This div is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash wrap. So the elements nicely wrap, as you can see on the finished site on smaller devices, gap dash X dash eight to provide some horizontal spacing, as well as gap dash Y dash 16 to provide even more vertical spacing. Within it, we simply want to get some products. For now, I'm going to mock an array of products. For example, let's do Apple iPhone, as we see it on the right side screen. Let's also do something like a book and let's do sneakers. There we go. And we can say dot map where we get each individual product 
and for each product, we automatically return something. For now, that something can be a div that's going to just simply render the product name, just like so. So now if we go back, you should be able to see three different products appear right there. Of course, later on, we're gonna turn these into actual product card components, so it's going to look much better. So with that said, let's go to the second component of the day, which is going to be the search bar. So with that said, let's dive into our second component of the day, which is going to be the search bar component. So to create it, you know the drill, we go into components and you create a new component called search bar dot TSX, run RAFCE to quickly create it, go back here, just call it as you would any self-closing component, double press it and then press control or command space and then press enter to simply import it right here at the top from components search bar. Once you have it, you can navigate to the search bar component and we can start implementing it together. As before, we're gonna first start with the UI and then we're gonna move to the functionality. So let's start by removing this div and rather returning a form component. This form is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash wrap, gap of four and margin top of 12. And of course we need an on submit, which is going to call the handle submit function. So of course we need to declare this, but first let's make this all visible in one line. We can declare our handle submit right here within the search bar component by saying const handle submit is equal to just an arrow function. And you're gonna soon notice that as soon as you do that, you get an error saying that we're using an on submit right here and that is considered an interactivity. So if you need to turn this into an interactive component, you need to turn it into a client component, which means that you at the top have to say use client. This means using a use client directive to turn it into a client side render component while everything else, such as this page, is going to be server side rendered. Within Next.js docs, they talk a lot about rendering environments, where you wanna render things, and when should you render things where. I believe it's somewhere on here, different rendering strategies, but then they explain how it streams, how we can have client side components within server side components, caching, and all sorts of other things. But sometimes it's not so easy to just go through all of the docs. And actually you need much more real life reference points to be able to fully understand how the server and client components work. This right here is a really nice table they created where they say when should a component be a server side component and when should it be a client side component. And essentially, whenever you add on clicks, on changes or states, that means that it has to be client side. In any other case, it is a server side. And that's also another thing we cover in depth in our Next.js course, where we really say that you cannot just use Next 13 just as good old React. You have to know about all of these server concepts and without realizing those things in depth, your app is gonna turn into a slow client side mess, which is exactly what happened to us. But then, yeah, once you learn all of these server side concepts, you can turn it around and you truly can feel the power of Next.js. So for now, I'm gonna pin this as well on the top. And it's pretty cool to pin these tabs as you can quickly get back to them later on. So in case we need to reference the finished site or the course content, we can just go here and here we have our local host. So yeah, with that said, we turned this into a use client and our entire page, original page, is going to be server side rendered. The only reason why we turned it to use client here is because we're using interactivity and we'll also be using hooks. Great. So now we can move over right here by creating an input within our form. What would the form be without an input, right? So we can give it a type is equal to text element and we can give it a placeholder equal to enter product link. If we save it, immediately you can see some kind of an input and we can also give it a class name equal to search bar input, which is just going to immediately style it a bit better. Next to the input, we wanna render a button component and this button is going to have a type equal to submit because we wanted to submit the form and we can give it a class name equal to search bar BTN. And it can say something like search. 
if we save this, it's looking much better. And we can close our search bar for now. We're gonna come back later on to give it interactivity. But now we can focus on our hero carousel, which is I think the most noticeable component of all, considering how much space it takes and how interactive it is. So with that said, I think we can remove this ugly border because now we can visually see the layout of the application we're creating. And we can focus on creating the hero carousel by going to our components and right here, say hero carousel.tsx, run RAFCE, and then simply import it right here by turning this into a self-closing hero carousel component and importing it from components hero carousel, closing the page and moving into the hero carousel. So let's implement this component next. And believe it or not, this is the first time in our application so far that we're gonna use a third-party package. I always say, don't reinvent the wheel. If great developers have already developed a nice looking carousel that allows you to switch images, why would you have to develop it on your own when we are in the world of the open source code? So with that said, let's go ahead and open our terminal by pressing control and then back tick or you can just go to view and then terminal right here and then see your shortcut there. Now, what you can do there is open up a new terminal by pressing this plus, and then we can install a new package by running the command npm install react-responsive-carousel. And once again, this is not just a package that I randomly found. This is a well-maintained NPM package with about 370,000 weekly downloads. It works really well with Next.js apps and here's how we can use it. So go to this NPM page. You can just search for the React Responsive Carousel on Google, and then we'll have to import this demo carousel example. So import just two of the import lines. This is going to give us the loader for our CSS. And then we have the actual carousel right here. And then you can also copy the demo, which is the carousel. And you can put it right here inside of this div. And of course, we'll want to indent this properly. So let's just select all of this. I'm holding control and then alt. And then now I'm moving everything with a backspace. So now within here, we have our carousel, we have imported the CSS, and we have imported the package itself. So now if we save this and go back, we can close this. You can see that it says that the super expression must be either null or a function not undefined. Okay, that's an interesting one. I'm guessing that's because we didn't provide too many props for our carousel and also that our images are actually fake. Uh, these are just copied from the documentation. So now we can actually modify it. And also it's not a good practice to use just a basic HTML5 image in Next if you can use the optimized Next.js image tag. So what we can do here is create a new, let's call it a utility uh, or a new constants array that we can say const hero images is going to be an array where we're gonna have multiple objects. The first one is going to have the IMG URL of forward slash assets, forward slash images, forward slash hero dash one dot SVG and it's going to have a alt tag of, I believe this is a smart watch. There we go, we can say smart watch. Now you wanna add a new one right here below and we can duplicate this a couple more times, however many you wanna have. In this case, we can have five, so I'm gonna duplicate this four more times. The second one is going to be two, three, four, five. Then we're gonna have a bag, we're gonna have a lamp, we're gonna have an air fryer and we're gonna have a chair. I think this is pretty diverse. So it means that our app can do anything. And now instead of just manually rendering all of these images right here, we can just open up a new dynamic block of code and say hero image, or rather it should be images. We can change it later. Dot map where we get each individual image and we immediately return a new image tag just like so by importing it from next image. A couple of things, let's rename this to images as a raise should always end with plural, meaning with an S. And then let's give it a source 
equal to image dot img url alt is going to be image dot alt width is going to be about 484 pixels as well as the height 484 i found this value to work the best it has to have a class name equal to object dash contain and it has to have a key since we're mapping over it of image.alt since we know that all of these are unique. So now if we save this, you can see it's still gonna complain, which is okay, but now we can provide some additional props to our carousel. And by quickly opening the React responsive carousel again, we can see right here below, that there are many different props you can pass depending on what you want it to do. So in this case, we can do a couple of things. We can say show thumbs, is going to be false. These are thumbnails of the images. We can do the autoplay. We can also turn on the infinite loop. So it's always going to loop. We can add the interval of about 2000 milliseconds. So two seconds per image. Show arrows is going to be set to false as well as show status is going to be set to false. After playing a bit with this, I found those values to work the best. And here's the thing, with all of this, with properly implementing our carousel, the page still breaks. Now, I want you to think about it because this is really important. Although it can seem like a random error, it's really important for you to understand why we're seeing this error. Well, first of all, we can see that this error is coming from React Easy Swipe, React Swipe. We don't even know what that is. We haven't even installed it. but the carousel package did behind the scenes. And if you look at the final carousel, what is it doing? Is it listening for some clicks? Is it interactive? Is it doing something? The answer is yes. And although, as we've seen in the React docs, you're not manually calling the on clicks or on changes or different states or stuff like that, you are using a package that does that. So what does that mean? Well, it means you need to turn this into a use client component because it deals with interactivity. So once you fix this, as you can see, we're back and we can actually loop over these different images through our amazing carousel. So this was really, really important because as you saw, even though you're not manually using something, you have to be careful of the packages we're using when it comes to the client and server side components. Similar thing goes to Framer Motion and all of these other packages, as well as some state management libraries like React Context for managing states and also Redux Toolkit. How are you gonna use these states if you wanna keep your app server side rendered? We dive deeper into all of those concepts within the course. First of all, with the deep dive lectures to truly understand how it works. Then we have a build and deploy, but of a really complex application. And then finally, there are active lessons where you can code things yourself to truly learn how to do it like a champ. So yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Now let's give this div a class name of hero-carousel. And if you save it, it's going to be a bit more manageable, a bit smaller. But yeah, I'm glad that you now know that even though you're not using those states or interactivity, maybe your packages are, and you still have to declare it as use client. And now the last missing piece of the puzzle is actually seeing this on a larger size right here on the finish site. And you see this nice error right here. Although it's small, it really draws the user in to enter this link because this link can be anything. It can be a new bag you want, a new lamp, or even an Apple Watch. So it really draws you in, and we wanna implement that arrow on our current application as well, which we can do simply by inserting a new image right here below the carousel with a source equal to assets, icons, hand drawn arrow dot SVG. Also notice how important it is to name your SVGs and icons in a meaningful way as you can easily refer to them. Alt is going to be arrow, width is going to be 175, and height is going to be 175 as well. If we save it, you can immediately see it, but we have to absolutely position it. So let's give it a class name. And here we can say max-xl 
it's going to be hidden. So on devices with a min width of 1,280, it's not gonna be there. But if it is, we wanna position it absolutely with a minus left 15%, like so. Bottom zero, and then Z index of zero. And bottom, I have to spell it correctly and save it. And now this is going to bump it up. Also left, I have to spell that correctly too. If you do that, it's going to look good. Even if you expand it, it still looks great, but on smaller devices, it disappears. There we go. How easy it is to use Tailwind for styling and responsiveness. Now we're done with our Hero Carousel. So we can close it and we can go back to our original homepage right here. So we have almost everything we need when it comes to the initial layout. We have a nice home screen where we can enter links. We have our trending where we'll be able to see the links that we created later on. But now it's time to scrape the data. Not even just scrape it, save it in the database and even update our users via email when the prices change, which means that we have to periodically scrape it as well for updates. And if you know anything about scraping, you know how hard it is to do it properly, especially considering many websites have blockers for scrapers, captchas, checks, and more. Thankfully, we'll use Bright Data in this video. So right here, Bright Data offers many, many different solutions, predefined data sets, and more. But in this case, we'll be using their Web Unlocker scraping solution. And in upcoming videos, we're gonna also play with more powerful scraping browser features. For now, let's go to the Web Unlocker. And here you can see they called it Unlocker because it can unlock and scrape the toughest websites. So you can access any public website at scale and leave unblocking to them. Uh, this is going to simulate real user behavior, overcome any bot detection, and so much more. So there's a lot of things that you can use this for. Uh, but in this case, I'm gonna give you a great example by scraping Amazon products from their website. So with that said, let's start implementing the functionality of our application. And of course, to do that, we'll have to start from our search bar. So let's collapse our browser a bit more to the side. As a matter of fact, we can collapse it all the way to our mobile view. It looks good as well. Um, and we're gonna have these ever-changing images on the right side although we can just maybe stop it for the time being by turning off the autoplay and the 2000 millisecond interval. If we do that, we're just gonna have a sticky image, which might be a bit easier for us while we're developing the functionality of our application. So with that said, let's go ahead and go to our page and then to our search bar, because this is going to be the first point of interaction. Right here, we'll have to enter the link and then we'll have to deal with some logic. So how are we going to do that? Well, first we have to keep track of the URL we entered and we can do that by using a use state property, which is going to be called search prompt. That search prompt is going to have its set search prompt and it's also going to start as an empty string. And then we have to import a use state coming from right here at the top, import use state from React. Now that we have this set search prompt, or no, rather it's going to be search prompt and set search prompt, just like so, we can now use it within our input. Now this input can accept two things. The first one being a value of search prompt and the second one being an on change handler that's going to be equal to, we get an event and then we simply set search prompt to be equal to e.target.value. So this is simply going to keep track of our value that's in the input within our state. And what that allows us to do is to do something when the submit is triggered. So we can go into our handle submit and here we get an event. And since we're using TypeScript, we need to define the type of the event. So it's going to be a form event coming from React. So you have to import it. And it's going to be of a type HTML form element right here. And you have to close it like so. Now it's going to know exactly what this event has. So here we just need to say event.prevent default. The default behavior of the browser once the form is submitted is to just reload the page. In the modern 
React and Next.js applications. We don't want that to happen because our apps need to have more of a native mobile feel. You're on an application, you're not on a website. So we wanna prevent that default behavior. Then once we do that, we need to check if the URL we entered is indeed a URL. So we can say const is valid link. And that's going to be equal to, to the call of a function which we can declare above. So here we can say const is valid Amazon product URL. And that's going to take in a URL of a type string and it's going to return. What is it going to return? Let me ask you. Is it going to be a string, an array, a Boolean? Can you know? Well, you can if you use proper naming, which is also something we teach in our course. You wanna start all Boolean variables with an is. That means that you immediately know what the output of this function is going to be. It's going to be a Boolean. And now that we have created this function, we can simply call it right here, is valid Amazon product URL, and we can pass in what? Our search prompt, which we're saving in the state right here. So now this variable right here is going to be the output of whatever check we implement right here. So let's ensure that check is good so our application doesn't break. Here, we can open up a new try and catch block. And in the try, we can first parse the URL by saying const parse the URL is equal to new URL and you pass in the URL or passing as a string. Then you wanna get the host name of that URL, which you can do by saying parse the URL that host name. This is going to be just the first part. For example, for JS Mastery Pro, it's going to be JS Mastery that Pro. So what we wanna do next, if we wanna check if host name contains amazon.com or Amazon dot something followed by a country code. Uh, there are many different Amazon sites worldwide, right? So we wanna say if host name dot includes amazon.com or hostname dot includes maybe something like amazon dot, right? Or maybe hostname dot ends with, and we wanna put the Amazon in there. So we have just a few different checks, which we can display on a few different lines. So it's easier to understand what we're doing. So if it is any of these cases, it means this is a valid Amazon link and we can simply return true, and otherwise we can return false right here. I think in the catch, we can also return false because something went wrong, so it's not a valid URL. So now if we go back to our current website, let's simply do an alert right here saying alert, and we wanna render is valid link, then valid link, else invalid link. So now if I type something like test and press search, we're gonna get invalid link. Even if I type a real URL, something like https colon forward slash forward slash jsmastery.pro, it's still an invalid link. Why? Because it's not an Amazon link. But if I do something like, let's do amazon.com forward slash MacBook, and we do search, it is an invalid link still. Let's try to turn it into a URL, https colon forward slash forward slash, and now it's a valid link. So this is just a check we're doing, which we can just collapse here to ensure that it indeed is a valid link. So now if the link is invalid, we can say if not is valid link, we can simply return to exit out of the function and then do an alert, please provide a valid Amazon link. There we go. So now we have the is valid link. And then in all the blocks of code below, we know the link is valid, so we can open up a new try and catch block. Here, we can turn on the loading. So I'm gonna create a new use state field called is loading and set is loading initially set to false. So once we click, this is definitely gonna take some time, right? In which case we wanna turn on the loading. So here in the try, we wanna start doing something. So I can say set is loading to true. And we can add a finally block, which is going to happen either way on try or catch. And whatever happens, we wanna then stop the loading. This loading can further be used within our application, within the button, by saying something like right here, 
if is loading, then this is going to be searching dot dot dot, else it's simply going to say search. And we can also use our current search prompt to define the disabled state. So if search prompt is triple equal to zero, then the button is triple equal to an empty string, then the button is going to be disabled as you can see. Great. So now we have implemented that one more check and in the catch, what we can do is simply console log the error, but the magic will truly happen in the try. So right here, we'll need to scrape our first product. This is going to be quite interesting. And to be able to do that, we're not gonna declare all the logic here. We actually want to create our first server action. So how do you declare server actions? Well, let's close our search bar and our page, and let's go all the way to a new folder we'll create called lib, as in library. Within it, we can create a new folder called actions, and within actions, we can create a new file called index.ts. Here, you can declare that file as a use server. This means that all the code written here will run only on server. And there, we can create a new function, and we can immediately export it by saying export async function, scrape, and store product. And this is going to be a function that accepts a product URL of a type string. And now we can start creating that function for scraping the product as well as saving it in our database because we want to be able to know and track the price later down the line. So let's focus on implementing this first server action and with it, our first scraping functionality of the day. So within here, we're gonna pass a product URL as the first and only parameter. And then of course, we wanna check if no product URL, meaning if it doesn't exist, we simply want to return means exit out of the function. If we do have a product though, we'll have to do try and catch block as we'll be dealing with asynchronous actions such as scraping and also database access. So what we can do here is in the catch, we can simply throw a new error and we can pass a template string of failed to create update product. And we can also render the error dot message. Great. So now this is great. We can declare the error as type any, but more importantly, what happens here within the try block? Here, we have to actually scrape the product. So let's say const scraped product is equal to await scrape Amazon product. And no, it's not as simple as that. We pass the URL, but now this is not a built-in function. This is something we'll have to develop. And I'm gonna teach you how to scrape all different kinds of applications. So let's create a new folder within our lib, which is going to be called scraper. And then within it, let's create a new index.ts file. Within here, we can create an export async function, scrape Amazon product. And it's going to accept a URL, which is going to be of a type string. And then we have our function. So now we can go back here and we can import scrape Amazon product from dot dot slash scraper right here at the top. And now it's our job to dive into the scraper function and implement the scraping functionality. First, we wanna make a check if a URL actually exists. So if there's no URL, we're gonna simply return. And then we wanna do a bright data proxy configuration. This is going to ensure that we can actually use bright data scraping to be able to get the product data. So just visit the link in the description to go to the bright data's website and then sign up that way. The link will most likely include some special credits for you to use so you can follow along with this video without any issues and without making any payments. So the process for you might be a bit different, but in general, you need to sign in for the platform. Once you sign in, you'll be greeted with a dashboard that looks like this. You have a new scraping browser, and after getting credits specifically for watching this video, you should be able to see your dashboard. Then right here, you'll be able to see many different services. 
such as Proxy Manager, Proxy Chrome extension, SERP API, and in My Proxies, you'll see even more stuff right here. You'll want to choose the Web Unlocker tool. So go to My Proxies and then click Add on top right and add a new Web Unlocker tool. Here, you can see monthly cost, but once again, you don't have to worry about that. You're getting all of these benefits and you have a solution name. We can name it something like price wise. And I don't think we'll need special features for now, nor the country. So for now, simply click add. We can easily change this later on. And yes, we want to create a new zone called price wise. Once you've created it, you can see your host, your username, your password, and all the other things. So let's utilize this within our code. Right here, we want to say const username is equal to, and now we want to get a string of, we can just copy this here and paste it directly. But what we want to do is we want to put it in the environment variables. So we want to ensure that all the data is safe. So let's create a new .env file. And within it, we can create a new bright underscore data underscore username variable, which is going to be equal to the string that we just copied. And we want to do the same thing for the password. So that's going to be bright underscore data underscore password. And that's going to be equal to the password that you have. Make sure to use your data right here. Once you have those, we can declare this username just by saying process.env and then bright underscore data underscore username. We want to repeat this by saying password. And then we want to do bright underscore data underscore password. Great. We also want to define the port that we want to call it from. And we can see some of that data right here in the base curl. So this is a huge thing that you have. So let's copy it. And let's just comment it out for now. Here, you can see the port number. So what we can do is we can declare it by saying const port is equal to 22225. We also want to declare something known as a session ID. So session underscore ID. And we can use some random numbers such as let's do 1 million. So that's one with six zeros. And we want to multiply that by math.random. And then we want to do a single or zero. So this is going to give us a session ID. We also want to define some additional options. So we can say const options is equal to, we want to have auth within it, which is going to contain the username. And the username is going to be a template string of username. And then we want to add a dash and then we want to define the session. And then we want to add the session ID as well. So this is how we define the username in the authentication part. And the password is simply going to be password. Finally, the host is going to be coming from here, brdsuperproxy.io. So we can define the host right here below the auth. So host is a string of brd.superproxy.io. Then we want to pass the port, which is port. And then we also can do something called reject unauthorized, which is going to be set to false. And essentially here we have everything we need. We have our options object. With this options object, we can actually make a request to get the data from bright data. So we can remove this curl and we're going to do it right here within our code. So let's open up a new try and catch block. Within the catch, we can simply declare the error as any and say throw new error, where it's going to be a template string of failed to scrape product and then error message. But again, in the try is where magic happens. So here we'll have to do the actual fetching by fetching the Amazon product page. So let's write that down, fetch the product page. And first, we need to get the response from that page by saying await axios.get, where we get a URL, and then we pass some additional options like so. And of course, we have to install Axios, which is going to be the second package of the day. So we can open up the terminal and run npm install Axios. And here, we're going to also use something known as Cheerio, such a cheerful name. So let's install those two packages and let me show you how we can use them. 
I think everybody knows Axios. It's just used to make API calls. But Cheerio, on the other hand, with such a cheerful name, is the fast, flexible, and elegant library for parsing and manipulating HTML and XML. A set of calls which you can use to really quickly parse through HTML. And what is data scraping if not parsing the HTML content you see? So we're going to use that. So let's immediately import right at the top Axios from Axios, as well as import everything as Cheerio from Cheerio. There we go. So now we have our response. And what we can do is we can just console log it. Let's see what do we get within this response or rather let's do response.data. So now we can save this. We're actually doing our proxy configuration using bright data. We should have some funds in there. Everything should be properly set up. And now we can go back to our actions and you can see that we're actually scraping this product. I mean, we're trying to call this scrape and store, which is then calling this scrape product, which is then console logging the response. But of course, to be able to see the output of this function, we have to be calling this function and therefore we have to call this function, scrape and store product, which if you remember correctly, was all the way in our search bar. Here, we were just preparing to scrape the product. So now we can actually do so. We can say const product is equal to a wait. Since we're doing a wait, we have to turn the handle submit into an async function. And then we can call scrape and store product coming from lib actions, and we can pass in the search prompt. Great. So now we should be seeing the output. And let's go ahead and go back to our local host. Now, my question for you is, do we open up the console or not? Where is this console log going to appear? Think about it. I'm going to open up this terminal right here and go back to where we have our app. And now I'm going to enter a product link. But this time, let's ensure it's a real product link. So let's go maybe to a MacBook Air. Let's do the first one right here. So let's go maybe to a MacBook Air. And let's go ahead, click the first one. We have the price right here, which is good. And let's copy the URL, go back, and then paste it right here within our application and press search. As you saw for a second, it said search but then it broke, at least it seems. So let's open up the console right here as well. And you can see that we have error, failed to create update product, failed to scrape, network error coming from scrape and store product. So now we know that we have an error right here coming from scrape and store product. So let's see, that is here where we call it. And that is this error that we display. And this error is most likely happening with this function because this is the only function doing some actual data fetching. What else we can do is open up the network tab and just try to repeat that request. So if we now expand this a bit so we can see it better and go all the way here and click search, you can see that we have a network request that fails and we're getting a typical course error. So let's go ahead and fix it together. Hey guys, editing Adrian here. I was just editing the video and I wanted to make one point. In this point in the application, I also needed to add the next.config.js file. And within here, we need to turn experimental server actions to true. Right now they're working absolutely perfectly and we're using them within our Next.js course, but they're still experimental. So you have to turn them on specifically. So the entire modified next.config.js is going to be in the GitHub gist down below. So simply copy it, paste it right here in the root of your directory, and hopefully this is going to help fix the error. But after some time, I just retried it and it worked. Still, it can be region dependent. So since I'm based in Europe, I'm also gonna try this Amazon from Germany right here, you can see by the ending. So I'm gonna give it a try, run it, and as you can see, it's spending, and then we get another status of 200, which means that it worked. So feel free to test this out. If you have your own Amazon in your country or region, you can try that. But what I can assure you is that on the deployed version of the application, all Amazons are going to work worldwide.
So you'll even be able to expand on this application and create different versions based on the countries and the regions. How cool is that? But now even cooler is what we get as the output of the console log of the response.data. Right here, as you can see, we have a lot of characters. And this is the entire scraped Amazon product details website. Now it's our turn to make some sense of it. So let's do that next. Right here, we're gonna initialize Cheerio for the first time. And usually how you do it is you name the variable dollar sign. And then you say Cheerio.load and you feed it the response.data that so far we just simply console log. So no longer do we have to console log it, but now we can use this dollar sign to extract the product title and other information. So we can say const title is equal to dollar sign, and then we get a product title like this. And then we extract the dot text, and then we can even trim it. So I hope you can see why Cheerio is pretty good. It allows you to easily get those values. Now, what do we do with it? Well, let's simply console log just the title right now. That's going to allow us to see if this is actually working. So I'm gonna open up the console. Keep in mind, everything is on the server side. And I'm gonna run search one more time. It's pending, and there we go. We have a full title right here. Apple 2023 MacBook Air. That's great, which means that this is working. So now let's extract all the other data. But before we do that, let me show you how you can figure out which data to extract. So the only thing you have to do is go to Amazon and then click inspect. And then you can try figuring out what you wanna get from here. So we wanna get the title, so you can select it. And you can see that this is an ID that has the title but then we also have a span within it with an ID of product title. And see what we did? We simply said, hey, give me the text of an element with an ID of product title. In the same way, if you wanna get the price or anything else on the screen, you would simply figure out what the ID or the class name or whatever is for that specific thing. That is it. So now we can go ahead and together extract all of the meaningful data for our application. And the next part we wanna do is extract the price. But as you can see, price has multiple spans over here. It's within a span and then we have more spans. And unfortunately, it doesn't have a specific ID. So sometimes you'll have to play a bit with the elements to extract the proper price or some other elements on the screen. So let's go ahead and figure out how to do that. We can say const current price is equal to and we're gonna call a function called extract price. And no, this is not a built-in Cheerio function. This is a utility function we'll create to keep this function clean. So let's create a new file right here within our lib, and it's going to be called utils.ts, as in utility functions. And within there, we can export function extract price. And it's going to get many different arguments we're gonna pass into it. And here we can immediately spread them by seeing elements, just like so. So all of them are gonna be put in this elements array. And now we can map over those elements by saying for const element of elements. And then we wanna get the price text by saying const price text is equal to element.text.trim. Once we do that, we wanna figure out if price text exists and if it does, we simply want to return price text dot replace. And what we want to do here is we want to eliminate all of the non-digit characters. So we can just keep all the characters of zero, nine, and then the dots as well. So we want to replace all the characters that are not zeros or nines or dots. And uh, this is just a regular expression that does that. So you can copy these characters. Or in this case, I would even use ChatGPT for things like this, such as write JavaScript replace function that removes non-digit characters. It's really useful for things like this. And as you can see, it's going to give us this specific string. We can use that, or you can use the one that I wrote here. Let's give it a shot with the one that ChatGPT gave us. It seems to be just a bit simpler. 
So it's just capital D. Now, what we want to do is if we're not in the loop, we simply want to return an empty string. Great. So now into this extract price, we can first import it from utils and we can pass everything we think might be related to price. Sometimes this is going to depend on different Amazon versions. So on amazon.com, it might be different from amazon.india, for example. You'll have to dive deep into it and figure it out. But I believe this is going to work for most. So here we can pass the dollar sign dot price to pay span dot a price whole. We can pass a second one, which is a dollar sign a dot size dot base dot a dash color dash price. And then the third one is dollar sign dot a dash button dash selected dot a dash color dash base. Again, sometimes this is going to be tedious work, figuring out where all of these elements on the screen are. But once you do it properly, we can now also console log the current price and ensure it is good. So let's go back to our website. Let's save it. Let's reload the page. And now we can enter that same link that we had here and paste it. Open up the console. And as you can see, we get current price is an empty string, which is not good. What we can do is try to figure out if we're maybe missing something. So here in this case, we're trying to get the price from the span. And here it is a dash price and a dash text dash price. So maybe we should instead trigger these values as well. So let's try to select these by a class name. So let's target an element that has a class name of a dash price and dot a dash text dash price. And this might do the trick. So if I go right here and select this link and paste it, let's see, what do we get? I get a 500 again. As I said, this is that problem with scraping worldwide websites, but this is only happening on localhost. So once we deploy the website, there's not going to be any problems like that. So for now, I'm going to switch back to our European German Amazon, and I'm going to give it a shot. Of course, for you, it should be still working. So let's click search. Okay, this one is working. And now we do get back the price, as you can see right here. If for you, some of these extractions don't necessarily work as they should, you can always check how Amazon is doing it and get the right class names, IDs, and everything, and then put them right here. But of course, we're going to try to keep this scraping file updated. So in case you're experiencing any problems, there's going to be a full version of this scraper file in the GitHub just down below. But for now, I want to teach you how to do it. So you can follow along. And then if something doesn't work, you can always copy that version. Great. So now let's go back to our price wise. And let's try to get our original price as well. So this could be a discounted price, but we want to do const original price. And we're going to also call the extract price function. And we can pass some different things. We can pass an ID of price block and then underscore our price. Sometimes it's going to be listed like that. Sometimes it's going to be listed as a dot a dash price dot a text price or a span dot a off screen. Um, I might have put this here, but rather it should have been here because this is the original price that we're seeing. And there are many different ways that these elements can be displayed. For example, this one doesn't seem to have a discount. But if we try to search for something else that does have a discount, let's see if that's available. Maybe if I go here, and I guess I should be looking at the German Amazon just so I ensure it works. This one right here does have a discount, which is pretty cool. So let's try to see how we can get the original price. Maybe it's this one. This one has the A off screen, as you can see right here. And this is what we're trying to get. A dash off screen. This is the original price. And then we have our price right here as well. So let's see how we're trying to fetch that. If I go here, this is under A price, A text price. We're trying to just get everything by properly figuring out how to extract those values. So let me show you how to do a few more of these to teach you how to actually extract values, and then we can move further. 
So for example, original price can also be under list price. So we can do a dollar sign and then put the list price right here. That's an ID. Sometimes it is also going to show up under dollar sign and then an ID of price block underscore deal price if it's a deal. And then the last one is going to be dot a dash size dash base dot a dash color dash price. Many of these different class names. So now if we save this and if we want to console lock the original price as well, we can do that. Go back here and click search. And it's loading. And as you can see, we get the original price, although this definitely doesn't seem to be parsed in the right way. So we might need to fix our extract price function. For that, I do believe that the original regular expression that we wrote made more sense. So let's put everything in a regular expression array. And then within it, we can put the top caret, which is shift and then six, I believe. And then you can do the backwards arrow and then D dot like this. And you can also ask ChatGPT to explain regular expressions to you. So we can do something like, tell me what this does. And now you can see, in summary, this expression is used to globally match and remove any character in a string that is not digit or a period. So now if we save this and go back, we can try one more time. And you can see that we get this number and this number, or rather these are strings right now. We'll have to turn them into numbers. But I wanted to include this as a part of the video. I didn't simply want to cut this out because modifying values and extracting values, figuring out how to extract values and then how to parse them is the main part of parsing the data and the main part of scraping. Because once you get the data, you have to make sense of it, okay? So we're just figuring out different ways how to clean up the data, okay? So now that we have the price, we have the original price as well, what we can do next is we can figure out if it is currently out of stock. So we can create a new variable, const out of stock, and that can be equal to a dollar sign. We have a hashtag of, let me just fix this, there we go, availability span, okay? And then we do a dot text, dot trim, dot to lowercase. And if that is equal to currently unavailable, then it must be out of stock. And we're going to immediately parse it as a Boolean because we have this equation right here. So if we save it and click search one more time, you can see out of stock is false, which is good. So sometimes you'll have to do some cleaning and figuring out how to display those values. Now let's try to get the image as well. So we can say const image is equal to dollar sign. And then this is going to be hash IMG BLK front. And then dot ATTR, which is the attribute of data dash A dash dynamic dash image. Or maybe this doesn't exist. So we're gonna have something else. So we can duplicate this. And that's going to be landing image and then the same attribute, okay? So sometimes you're gonna have to have different versions of these things. And now we can get the image, save this. Let me show you how we got it first. So you can see this image right here. In this case, it's a video, but there we go. If I select it, take a look what it says right here, image. And it's going to have an ID somewhere. I cannot see it there, but I can see it when I hover. See, landing image, okay? So this is how we're getting that image. And then we're getting the attribute of data A dynamic image, which is the URL. So now if I go back and if I just search again, if I open up the console, you can see we get all different sorts of images. And if I click it, there we go. Great, so that is working well as well. Let's see what else do we wanna fetch. Once we get the images, we want to parse them. So we want to say const image URLs is equal to object.keys json.parse image. And this is not really an image. It's rather images, considering it's plural. And we can say const properly. So now we're passing those images. We can do it here as well. 
it's complaining saying that it's a string or undefined. So we have to add another or and then put that as an empty object so we can properly parse it. Because if you notice correctly, this was returning an object, right? An object of different strings within it. So we just want to get the keys. So if we save this one more time, but now instead console log the IMG URLs, it should be much more readable. So let's try it one more time. Open this up. And you can see now we get just the images. So as I said, once again, it's all about parsing the data properly. We can also get the currency by saying const currency is equal to extract currency. And then we're going to pass in the dollar sign and then dot a dash price dash symbol. Okay. But now this is another function that we have to create. So let's go into our utils right below our extract price and let's create export function extract currency where we get an element of a type any and then there we can extract it by saying const currency text is equal to element dot text dot trim dot slice and we only want to get the first character finally if the currency text exists then we can return the currency text else we can return an empty string. Could we have done this right here within this function? We could have, but this is just a bit cleaner, right? We extracted it in another function. So now we save it and we also want to do the currency right here just to see if we're getting it properly. So I'm just going to click search once again. And at the bottom, in this case, it should be Euro. If we're doing Amazon.com, it should be the dollar or in India, it should be a rupee. So this is good. And now what we can do is we can continue by getting the discount rate. So that's really important when building a discount application. So const discount rate is equal to dollar sign and then dot savings like this savings percentage. And then we want to get the dot text dot replace. And we want to remove everything that is not a percentage. So how do we do that? Well, we do a forward slash to start the regular expression within it an array and then minus percentage. We close the array, close the regular expression, say G for global and then this. So this is going to replace it. And let's try to just console log it. Discount rate right here at the end. And we can try one more time. And now, as you can see, we get 13. So this is just the number without the percentage. It's going to remove it from the equation. Whereas here, you should be able to see, there we go, we have 13. Great. So now we're getting a lot of stuff from here. Maybe the most important parts are going to be just the title of the product and then the current price and the difference between the prices. So we figure out when is the best time to buy as well as the images. On the deployed side, we also have a description but it's going to be really hard to parse the description as a description of an Amazon product contains a lot of stuff. So you can see you have a lot of things here and then you have a lot of images, a lot of different stuff. And sometimes this can be really hard to properly parse. If you want to play with that, that's okay. Give it a shot. You might end up with something that looks like this, right? It's really hard to properly parse into unique blocks of markdown or text that is not simply just crunched together. So in this case, I would even just completely skip this part right here and just focus on what matters the most, which are all the different prices, the title, the images, and more. So with that said, this is more or less the most important part that we need right now for the product. But now, instead of console logging it, we simply want to form it into a data object. So we want to say construct data object with scraped information. And now here we can say const data is equal to, and here you can pass anything we might need. We can start with passing the URL of the product. We can then pass something like a currency. So we can say currency is either going to be a currency we fetch, or it can default to the dollar sign, something like that. Uh, so we can do an or right here. Then we need to pass an image, which is going to be IMG URLs or image URLs of zero. Then we want to pass the title. We want to pass the current price, which is going to be a number 
of a current price. We want to turn it into a number. Same thing for the original price. We also want to create a new array called price history, which at the start is going to be set to an empty array, but later we can update it. Then what else do we have? We have a discount rate, which is going to be a number of a discount rate. And later on, if you want to play with additional things, try to fetch the category. For now, I'm just going to default it to category. If you want to play with it even further and test your knowledge, hey, get the reviews count. Get the number of stars the product has, like this. For now, I'm going to default it all to something like 100. And I'm going to do the stars of 4.5. There we go. Um, and then is out of stock. We have that, right? Is out of stock is going to be out of stock variable. Now, let's go ahead and console lock this data to see how does it look like. So all this time, we're just figuring out how to extract values and how to clean them so we can then create our application based off of this clean data. And there we go. Let me just scroll down here. And you can see we get all of the images. We get the currency symbol, the URL, the title, the current price as well. And not too much after, we have our next successful call, but we still have some issues we can see that some of our current price and original price values are none. So let's go ahead and fix it. Well, here we're replacing the values, but it's not always going to be the same. Sometimes we'll have euros, some people will have dollars, and some people will have rupees and all other kinds of different currencies. So we have to give our best to try to make it work for all of these different websites. Of course, that requires a lot of work, and sometimes you might have to make things work for your own country or website, but I'll try to cover as much as possible. And also, whenever Amazon changes the way their website looks or their class names or IDs, you'll have to modify your scraper too. It's just how it is. So for that exact reason, in the description down below, in the GitHub gist, you can find the updated utils.ts, which will try to keep up to date. So if you notice that something is now working right now, you can just paste this one right here. Here, we have some different formatting for numbers. And also we updated our extract price thing right here. So this extract price, just get the clean price and return it in the proper way. And also we have some imports here, which for now we can comment out. And we also have some other functions using those imports. So we have the extract price, we have extract currency, we have extract description, and then we have get highest price as well as get lowest price and get average price and get email notification type. And all of these things use specific values coming from something known as price history item. And this is nothing more than a TypeScript type, same as product and others. So let's immediately get everything we need from our imports. Both the product and the price history item will be coming from add forward slash types. So let's create a new folder right here called types. And then within it, we can create a new index.ts. In the GitHub just down below, you can find the updated index.ts where you can see all of the different kinds of types we'll be using, such as our product type, our notification type, user and price history item. We're gonna go through all of these once we use them later on in the code, but for now, this allows us to import them from types. And when it comes to the notification and threshold percentage, these are used only in one function, which is the get email notification, which we're gonna use later on. So for now, we can simply comment it out so we can proceed with our application. Great. So now we have our utils and the extract price should be working perfectly. So if we go back right here into our scraper and reload the page, and again, use the same product we used before and press search and then open up the console. As you can see, now we have the correct price. This is great. And we can also get to the description. So right here, we can say const description is equal to extract description. And then we pass the entire dollar sign. And this is coming from utils right here. Great. So now we have everything. And let's ensure we're properly passing everything. If we don't have the current price here, you can put or, and then say original price in the same fashion. If you don't have the original price, you can say, or, and then current price because Amazon sometimes uses these interchangeably. 
And I got to say, their IDs and class names are not the best. And now we can also add description is equal to description. And finally, we need four different values, which are going to be used internally within our application. And these are the values that make our application special, not the current price and the original price, but the current average highest and lowest. This allows us to properly track how the price is changing across time, allowing us to buy it at the best price possible. So right here at the bottom, we can add lowest price is a number of current price because we're right now, right? Currently, it is the lowest one because it is the only one, right? Then we can add the highest price. And similar, this is going to be the original price. And in both of these cases, if the other one exists, we can make it the other one. So this is going to be the original. And here, if this one doesn't exist, it's going to be the current one. Next, we have the average price, which by default, we can set to something like current price or original price. And this is it. I know it might not seem as clean as possible, but when you're parsing data and extracting information, it can get messy. So for one final time, let's just try to call this URL and see what kind of data do we get and how does our final data object look like. So as you can see here, we have the URL, we have the currency, the current price, the original price, the title, category, which you can extract later on if you want to, price history, stars, out of stock, description, lowest price, highest price, and the average. Great. So this is looking great to me. And the only thing we have to do is instead of console logging it, we have to return the data object right here from this scrape Amazon product function. Now that we are returning our new product data object, we have to see where we're using it. And the scrape Amazon product function is being used within our actions, scrape and store. Notice how scrape is only one part of the goal of this function. And we have done that successfully. We have scraped the product. So we can say, if no scrape product, we can exit it. But if we do have the scrape product, we'll have to store it in our own database. And this is where things get interesting and where we really get to the bottom of the functionality of our application. We want to get all of the products that the users input into our application and store them and then periodically check for the changes in the price by scraping them not on demand, but periodically, as I said. And then we can send automatic email alerts as soon as the price drops. How cool is that? So the next thing we have to do here is either find the product in the database or create the product in the database, which is going to allow us to keep track of the changes in the price. So for now, we know that this is working properly. I'm going to keep all of these links at the top, but I can just pin them so it's a bit easier to see. We also have our bright data here. You should have gotten your 15 bucks of credits. So don't worry, that's going to be more than enough to test everything out and even to deploy your application to the internet. And I'm gonna just leave price-wise here unpinned and we can collapse this all the way because now we're gonna start focusing on the backend of our application or more specifically interacting with the database. So to do that, before we actually scrape the product, we can try to connect to DB. And this right here is a function which we can create in another file just to keep everything nice and tidy. This is going to be within a new file called mongoose that's within the lib folder. Mongoose, as that's going to be the data modeler we're going to use for our MongoDB database. So mongoose.ts. And within here, we can import mongoose coming from mongoose. And as a matter of fact, we can also install it. So let's go to our terminal and let's run npm install mongoose. Mongoose is going to help us make a connection to our MongoDB database. Let's just reopen this file so we can see that everything is good. And then here we can create a variable let is connected, which is going to be set to false by default. And this is a variable to track the connection status. Once we have this variable, 
we can then export const connect to db. And this is going to be an async function that's going to do just that, connect us to the database. So now that we're exporting it, let's go back to our actions and let's import it from Mongoose. And now it's our turn to develop this function to actually do its thing. First, we want to set Mongoose's strict mode to prevent unknown field queries. And we can do that by saying mongoose.set strict query, and that's going to be set to true. That's going to just help us ensure that our application is working nicely. Then we have to figure out if we have a MongoDB URI, meaning a connection to our database. So if there's no process.env.mongodb URI, then we can simply return a console log saying something like MongoDB URI is not defined. Then we need to check if we already have been connected. So if is connected, return console log using existing database connection. And finally, if we are not connected and if we do have a MongoDB URI, we can open up a new try and catch block. In the catch, we can simply console log the error. And in the try, we can await mongoose.connect. And the connect accepts the URI of the database we want to connect to. And that's going to be our process.env.mongodb URI, just like so. Then we want to turn on is connected to true. And we want to give a simple console log, something like mongodb connected. There we go, something like this. And now what we can do is save this, but we have to get access to our MongoDB URI of the database we want to connect to. And to get it, you can head to mongodb.com forward slash Atlas. This is going to give you the ability to use their online cloud database completely for free. So either sign in, sign up, or create a free account. In this case, I'm going to connect with Google. And once you're in, you'll have to build a database. So let's go ahead and choose the free version. And you can just choose your region. I'm going to keep the recommended one and click create. Here, you'll have to choose the username and password. I'm going to choose JS Mastery. And then for password, do whatever you want, but make sure to remember it as you will need it later on. And then click create user. Great. So now we have two different users. And then you have to go to network access, add IP address, you can add your current IP address, but what you can do as well is add 0, 0, 0, 0. That's going to look like this, which is going to include all IP addresses. This is just to ensure that you can freely follow along with the video and have no problems accessing your database. Great. So once that is done, you'll go to database and then press connect right here. You want to connect using your Node.js driver. So we simply need to copy this string right here. That's the connection string. Once you copy it, you can go to your .env and here you can just paste it. But of course we have to give it a name such as mongodb underscore URI is equal to this thing right here. And then you have to enter your username, which in this case is the username of the user you created. And then the corresponding password. I just went one, two, three, one, two, three. So once you have it, now our application will be able to read it right here. And you might need to rerun the application just to be 100% sure that it's going to notice it. And after that, once you call this connect to DB, you should be able to connect to the database, which means that we should be able to find or search for, but then more importantly, create new instances of documents and collections within our database. So now that that is done, you can go back to your application, reload it and click search. And then you're going to get an error saying dot set is not a function. And this right here points to the dot set, which is right here, mongoose dot set. But this indeed is good. We can see that this is a real mongoose function we can call. So this makes me think that we're not properly calling this mongoose function and we can see it here. But at the top, I have use sever instead of use server. So if we fix this now, it should be working. Let's give it another shot by running the search command and opening up the console and MongoDB indeed got properly connected. 
This is great. We're still cons logging the price and we don't have to do that anymore. So if we go to the search bar, scrape product, and then we go to the scrape price or extract price, we no longer have to add a console log right here. This now means that we are properly connected to our database, which then means that we can go back to where we started right here. And after we get the scrape product, we can either find it already existing in the database or create a new instance of that product in the database so we can start tracking its price. So here we can say let product is equal to scraped product. And then we can try to find an existing product. So const existing product is equal to a weight, but now we're stuck. What are we calling? What kind of product are we trying to find from the database? Is this some kind of an item or is this some kind of a document or a collection of documents in the database? We don't yet know. We have only created the database. But the way that document-oriented databases like MongoDB work is you have to create a schema or a model for what you're trying to store in the database. So let's hold our thought right here for a bit and let's create our first and only model in our application by creating a new folder in the lib called models and creating a new file called product.model.ts. Inside of here, we can import mongoose from mongoose and we can say const product schema is equal to new mongoose dot schema with a capital s and then we pass in an object which is the definition of the schema so each one of our products is going to have a url which is going to be of a type string it's going to be required so required to true and it's going to be unique to true as well we can only have one product under a specific URL. Then we want to have a currency of that product, which is going to be a type string and required to true. We also want to have an image, which is going to be of a type string. Since we're going to store the URL of the image and required to true, then we're going to have a title of the product, which is going to be type string and required to true. We're going to have the current price which is going to be of a type number required true. We're going to have the original price, which is going to be really similar. So original price, and that's going to be of a type number required to true. Then we want to keep track of price history, which is really important for our application, where we have an array of different prices, which are of a type number and required to true. And we also keep track of the date when that price was updated. So right here, we can expand this object because it's going to contain the prices or rather it's going to contain a single price, right? So an array of prices and it's going to have a date when that price was added. So that's going to be a type of date and a default of date dot now. And we need to add a comma here. After the price history, we're going to have a few more fields such as lowest price, which is going to be of a type number, but it's not going to be required. We're going to also add the highest price, which is also going to be type number. We need an average price, which is also going to be of a type number. And we need a discount rate, which is also going to be of a type number. We need a description, which is going to be of a type string. We need a category of a type string as well. We need a reviews count, which is going to be of a type number. We need is out of stock, which is also going to be type Boolean. And by default, it can be set to false. We need users, which is going to be an array where we have an email that's going to have a type is equal to string and required is set to true. And the default for users is going to be an empty array. So how many users have selected or searched for that product? And finally, we want to exit this existing block, which is the definition. And we want to say timestamps is set to true. So this is going to keep track of the changes. Now we have to turn this schema into a model based off of which we'll be able to create documents. So we can say cons product is equal to 
mongoose.models.product or if it doesn't exist yet, we want to create one mongoose.model of a name product that's going to be based off of the product schema. And finally, we can export default the product model. Now that we have created this, we can go back to our index and now we can await product.find. Of course, after we import it from models, product models, and we can find one actually, and we can find it based off of its URL. So URL has to be scrape product.url and we can expand this so we can better see it. Now, if an existing product exists, then what we want to do is we want to update the price history. So we can say const updated price history is equal to an array where we first spread the existing product dot price history. And then we update the price by saying price is scrape product dot current price like so let's properly indent this. There we go. And then we want to modify the product object by saying product is equal to, we first spread the scrape product and then we update the values by saying price history is now equal to the updated price history. The lowest price is equal to get lowest price, which is going to be coming from utils and we pass the price history or the updated price history. So make sure to import this get lowest price at the top coming from dot dot slash utils. And this price history here, it's complaining that it doesn't exist. So just for now, we can give this updated price history a type of any. And we do a similar thing with the highest price where we just call the get highest price, again, coming from dot dot slash utils. And we pass the updated price history. And same thing with average price, which is equal to get average price coming from dot dot slash utils where we pass in the updated average history. And here it's complaining about the average price saying that it does not exist in type. And then it started giving us this type of the product, but we know that product indeed has the average price. If we look into it right here, we have lowest, highest, and then average. So later on, I'm going to see why we're getting that error for now. We know it's good. And finally, whether we found this product in the database or not, we want to create a first instance or the new product, whatever it is in the database. So we can say const new product is equal to await product dot find one and update. So if we did find one, then we can again, filter it by URL is scrape product dot URL. Then we can put this in multiple lines right here just so it's easier to see what's happening. There we go. The second parameter is going to be the product or the data we want to update this with. So this is the entire product object. And then we want to add additional options such as upsert to true and new to true. So if it doesn't yet exist, it's going to create one in the database. Great. So now let's see what do we have here. I'm noticing that I have to close it like this. So here we first try to find the URL based on the scraped URL. We close this right here and then we pass these as the second and the third parameter. So here we need to add a comma, then we update the product and then we add new if one doesn't exist before. Great. And finally, here's a next yes thing. If you don't revalidate the path, it's not going to automatically update it. You will be stuck in cache. So what you need to do is you need to import something known as revalidate path coming from next cache. And then we want to say this page right here, which we can define as revalidate path of template string forward slash products. And then forward slash, we want to go to the ID of the new product. So new product ID, this page is going to change because we're now modifying it. Great. So now we are either finding a product in the database or we're creating one if it doesn't exist yet. So what do you say that we test it out? If we don't have any major errors, the next time that we search for our product, it should actually get added to the database. 
And how can we know that? Well, we can check the errors if there are any, or if not, we can check our database. So let's go ahead and press search right here. MongoDB connected. It is still searching. It seems that the search went through. And now if we go to our database, reload the page, go to our collections, and you can see our test products right here. And there we go. You can see our first product with its description, category, created ad, highest price, and all of those great things, as well as the price history, the reviews count, the title, and more. So this means that the product has been successfully created. Now, if we call it for the second time, a new product should not be added. So if I click right here and then reload the database right here by clicking refresh, we should only see one product still. That's because if it changed, it should change it right here. And now we have the price history of the previous price of that product. I hope this makes sense. It's a really specific application where we're trying to first get the products that people are interested in and then keep them updated at all times so that we can show the new price once it changes. And a huge thing you're gonna learn about in this video, which you maybe didn't even know, is we're gonna run a so-called cron job. This means we'll have to create some kind of an action that runs independently of us running it manually. We can execute it at a specific day of the week, at a specific minute, hour, interval, this is so good. And then we can refetch the new prices of those products by automatically scraping the data from Amazon. How cool is that? It's like having a personal assistant that can go through all of your favorite products and then tell you when it's the time to buy. Cool. So now we are actually saving that in the database. And now that we have the data, we can actually show the product details of that page on our own website. So while we're here, let's create an action that's going to allow us to fetch the product based off of its ID. We can collapse this function and just below create an export async function, get product by ID. And we wanna pass the product ID as its first and only parameter. Then we open up a new try and catch block. We have to connect to our database. On every call of these functions, we have to connect because you can think of these as edge functions, meaning they run separately. This code only gets executed once the function is called. So we don't have heavy load on our server. Another beauty of Next.js. So these server actions are incredibly useful. And once again, going back to the course, every single functionality of this huge modern stack Orflow clone is done using exactly the same system. We create models, in this case, not one, but many, and then we create server functions that then act as a bridge between our server-side render front-end application and our server. And actually, please allow me to give you a behind the scenes of the course where we're explaining some of these concepts. So here, as you can see, we're dealing with the concept of webhooks as well, databases, and then exactly how this server-side and client-side functionality works but I think this diagram explains it the best. And it's the same thing what we're doing right now. So first we have server-side rendered pages, which do something. These server-side pages in this case are our homepage right here. That's a server-side page. But then on it, we have a client component, which is search. So in this case, not ask a question. In this case, it's a search component. This search component then calls a server action call in the database and then that does something in our database, such as make a document or find a document. It returns it, which then gets back to our server-side rendered page. And the reason why I was drawing this is because this is all contained within a single Next.js 13 full stack application. If we didn't do that, then you would have to have multiple applications. You would have to have the front-end app. You would have to have the back-end app. You would have to have the database, right? And as you can see, this gets pretty messy pretty soon. So yeah. That's the point of using server actions. They're pretty cool. And that's exactly what we're doing in this video right now. So to connect to our database again, it's as simple as adding this line as we have already created a function. And now we need to fetch the product. So we can say const product is equal to await product.find1, where the underscore ID is equal to, to the product ID. If we don't have a product, 
we simply exit out the function or return null, and otherwise we return the product. In the catch, we can simply console log the error. This now allows us to go back to our details page, fetch all the details about the stored product, and display it in a nice screen just like this. So let's do that next. Let's close all of the currently open files. We have many. Then let's go to our app and let's create our second and the last route of the day by creating a new folder called products. Within it, creating another folder called square brackets ID. And within that ID, creating a new page.tsx and running RAFCE. This is going to create a sample page, which is going to be product details. Now, if we save this and go to some kind of a forward slash products, forward slash, and then enter some random characters, you'll be able to see the product details. There we go. So now, first, we're going to finalize the homepage by showing all of these new trending products that all of our users have been adding. And then we're gonna implement a connection between clicking this and opening a product page. So we can continue where we left off by going to pages, going to our homepage, and then here, now we can loop through all the products, real products from the database, and then go to their corresponding detailed pages. So let's do that next. Within our server actions that are in the lib and then actions and then index.ts, we have created get product ID and scrape and store product. But now we need to create another one, which is get all products. So we can do a similar thing, export async function, get all products. And then we just render it like this, open up a new try and catch block and then connect to DB as we usually would. So just another call to the function we have created before. Now, once we connect, this call is the simplest of them all. We simply say const products is equal to await product.find and we call it like so, and then return the products. Finally, if we have errors, we can for now just console log the error object and see what we get. So now that we have created this function and that we are exporting it, we can import it within our page right here at the top. We can say import get all products coming from lib actions. And we can utilize it right here on the top as if we're calling a regular function. But this is a special server function that's making a call to our database. But Next.js makes it so simple. There's no use effects, there's no states. The only thing you have to do is say async and then fetch it right here by saying const all products is equal to await get all products. And that's it, you have access to it. So now we can loop over instead of this demo fake array, we can loop over all products which are now coming from the database. We can hover over it and it says that all products is possibly undefined. So we can simply add a question mark right here. Thank you TypeScript for saving us. So now we save this. And if we go back to our current application, it looks like something broke. So I'm just gonna press control C and then Y and then rerun our application. And we get the same error again, which means that we are stuck in some kind of a loop. Maximum call stack size exceeded. We never want to see this type of error. So let's see what mistake did I do. Uh, it looks like it's happening right here. And it's not really clear what this error is referring to. So we're fetching the products. We're getting all products from here. This is a separate function connecting the database, running the products.find, and that's it. We have to figure out when did this error start appearing. So if I comment this out, and if I comment out all of the products right here and save it, is the error going to go away? It will, interesting. So now once again, if I bring it back, we again have the error. Okay, this is interesting. So this gives us some data to work with. And I'm really glad it happened because my goal is to include as many errors as possible 
throughout the process of teaching you how to develop this application. So maximum call stack exceeded. Let's figure it out together. Usually this happens when you have infinite loops, but in this case, oh, I think I know what it is, but it's weird that it resulted in this error. Um, before our product was just a string, right? We have something like a test right here. And then the product was simply a product, uh, which worked because we can simply render a string right here. But now a product is much more complex. It contains more aspects. So instead of doing just product here, we can do a product.title, which is then going to make more sense and hopefully render our Apple MacBook Air. So this is now good. Again, it was weird that we got an error that is usually happening for infinite loops when we just didn't put a dot title there. I'm guessing that's because MongoDB has a special way of creating its documents in the database. So this is not just a typical object. It contains some more complex properties, which caused Next.js to just black out. So this is now good, but we don't want to simply return a title. We want to return a card that has more information about each individual product. So let's go into our components and let's create a new file called product card.tsx. We can run refce, import that product right here by saying product card, and it can simply be a self-closing component like so. The only thing we have to do is pass in a key equal to product dot underscore ID and a product itself. There we go. So this is it. And now we can import the product card. And now we show a one single product card. Make sure to put this question mark right here, just to ensure that we don't have any errors. And looking at the product, it's saying that right now, this card doesn't accept any such props. But if we go into the product card, we can now define what do we accept within that card we can say that we get a product and this product is going to be of a type props. So right here, we can define interface of props. And the most important and the only thing is going to be a product of a type product, which is coming from our types. So now it's no longer going to complain right here. We can accept all of those product props and we can start displaying them on a product card, which is right here on the right side. So instead of simply saying product card, let's actually turn this entire thing into a Next.js 13 link component. And the link of course has to have an href. This is our bridge to the details page. Here we can say go to forward slash products forward slash and then product dot underscore ID. We can also give it a class name equal to product dash card. Within it, we can render a div and this div can render an image. The image is the Next.js 13 image tag, and we can give it a source equal to product.image and an alt tag equal to, let's do product. Dot, I believe it's title. And if I were to type name here, you can see how TypeScript lets me know that, hey, it's actually title. Let's give it a width of about 200 and a height of 200, as well as a class name equal to product dash card underscore IMG. So if we save this, you can now see this wonderful looking image. Let's style the div a bit to make it a bit smaller by giving it a class name equal to product dash card underscore IMG dash container. And now it's going to be contained really nicely. We can also dive into this container a bit by going to the search and pasting the name and I believe we don't need to add this BG white 100. We can just leave it white as it is, as most Amazon products require completely white backgrounds. So this is going to make it more nicely blend in. So now below this div containing the image, we can also create another div that's going to contain the rest of the content. So let's create a class name equal to, let's do flex and flex call, as we're gonna show the content in one line and then a gap of three. Then we can render an H3 that's going to render the product.title. And let's save it. There we go. Looking good, but we can style it a bit by giving it a class name equal to product-title. 
There we go. Next, we can give another div for more descriptive content. So a class name of flex and justify between. Then we can render a p tag within it. This p tag is going to render the product dot category. And in all cases, it's just going to say category for now. And we can also give this p tag a class name equal to text dash black opacity dash 50 and text dash LG as well as capitalize. For now, it's simply going to say category, but if you figure out how to extract the real category from Amazon, then you can just fuse it right here. Next, below this P tag, we're going to have another. This P tag is going to have two different span elements. The first span is going to render the product question mark dot currency. And the second one is going to render the current price. If we save this, you can see it's looking a bit better. We can also do a class name equal to text dash black, text dash LG and font dash semi bold. So now this is looking better. And again, on mobile, it's looking good. But if we expand it, it's just going to be one card in a row looking wonderful as well. And with that, believe it or not, we're done with our product card. And once we click the card, we go right here in another URL. We visit products and then the ID of that specific product, which brings us right here to this new product details page we have created. But now the question is, how do we get access to the ID of this product from within this component or page? Well, we get it through params. So here we can define params and this is done for us by Next.js. We can say props and that's going to be of a type props. It's going to contain params of ID is of a type string. There we go. We have declared a type and now we can get the ID by immediately destructuring it from params right here. And we can display it within this div. So if we do that, now you can see the ID of our product, which means that we are ready to fetch all of the product details based off of that ID. See, it ends with 974723. And if we go here, 974723, we are ready to make a call to our database, fetch all of these values, and then nicely display them just like this. So let's do that next. I'm going to collapse this and we are ready to make a call. Do you remember that get product by ID function that we created not that long ago? Well, now we can put it to use by saying const product is equal to await. Of course, we have to turn this into an async function since we're using await. And then we can say get product by ID by importing this from lib actions. And we can simply pass over the ID. Then if we don't have a product, we can simply redirect to forward slash. And this redirect is coming directly from next navigation. So we can import it from there. In this case, we indeed do have a product. So all of the details about that product should be in there. How can we know? Well, let's try to render the product dot title now that we have the product. And there we go. You can see it here, which means that the rest of the stuff is here as well. So let's go ahead and create this great product details section. Let's first start by adding a class name to this outer div, a class name equal to product dash container. If we save it, that's going to already space it up a bit. And within there, we can remove the product title and we can create a new div. Within this div, we can place another div. And within that div, we can place a self-closing image tag. Here, we can give it a source equal to product.image. And we can, of course, import image from next forward slash image. The image also needs to have an alt, which is going to be product title. It needs to have a width equal to 580 pixels. And also it needs to have a height. Let's do something like 400 and the class name of MX for margin X of auto. If we save this, we should be able to see a nice looking image appear. Now let's add class names to outer divs 
the first outer div can have a class name equal to flex, gap of 28 to provide some spacing. On extra large devices, flex row, but usually flex call as we want all the elements to appear in a column. And then this div can have a class name equal to product dash image. If we save this, you can see it just puts it in this nice looking card. And now we can go below this div containing the image and we can create a new container div for our content. So here we can have a class name equal to flex dash one, flex and flex dash call. Within it, we can continue creating the structure of our application. So we'll need to have a structure for this top part and then a line and then the bottom part right there. So first we're just positioning everything right here on the screen and on the large screen, this is going to look like this. We're gonna see some products on the left, some on the bottom, but on smaller devices, these are going to go on the right and on mobile devices, they're again going to go on the bottom. So to create that structure, we have to have a div and that div is going to have a class name equal to flex, justify dash between, items dash start, gap of five, flex of wrap, and padding bottom of six. Within it, we can create one final container div that's going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and a gap of three. Within there, we can finally render a P tag. And this P tag is going to render the product dot title. If we save it and go back, you can see it right here. Let's make it look a bit better by giving it a class name equal to text dash 28 pixels to make it larger, text dash secondary and font dash semi bold. And already this is looking more like a title and less than a paragraph. Now below that, of course, we wanna render a link that's going to allow us to visit the product. So let's do it right here below the P tag. It's going to be a link component, which we have to import from next forward slash link. We can give it an href, which is going to be product.url. We want it to open in a new tab so we can say target is going to be equal to underscore blank. And we can give it a class name equal to text dash base, text dash black, and opacity of 50. Finally, within it, we can do visit product. If we save it, we're gonna have a nice looking kind of a button, right? Great. Now we wanna go below this div and we wanna start creating the second section, which are these hearts right here and other three icons. So let's create a div that's going to wrap them. Let's give it a class name equal to flex items dash center and the gap of three. Also, we're gonna give it a div and that div is going to have a class name equal to product dash hearts. And within it, we wanna render an icon, which is going to be in form of an image that's going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash red dash heart dot SVG, an alt tag of heart, a width of 20, a height of 20 as well. So if we save this, you should be able to see this little heart. And right next to it, we can render a P tag with a class name equal to text dash base, font dash semi bold, and text dash, that's going to be D46F77. This is this nice pinkish color that's going to render, I believe it's product dot reviews, or maybe it's number of reviews. Yeah, this shows nothing, but what if I go number of reviews? No, it's not that. Let's try to figure out what do we have in the product. And here we didn't define the type of this product. So we can say product of type, and then here we can get the product from our add forward slash types. And now it's going to immediately complain. See, number of reviews doesn't exist. But if we go into the product, we can see that it should have, let's see, we're looking for reviews count, exactly. 
And this is how, again, TypeScript makes your life easier, especially on large applications. And now we should see something like 100. Okay, great. Let's go a bit below the product cards in another div, create a second div that's going to have a class name equal to p-2 bg white 200 and a rounded of 10. This is going to create this nice border or just a circle for now. And within it, we can render an image that's going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash bookmark dot SVG. We can give it an alt tag to bookmark, a width of 20 and a height of 20. That's going to make it look like this. If you want to, feel free to implement that functionality to maybe like it, save it to local storage, or do anything else. That would be pretty cool. And whenever you do make any updates to the applications that you're watching on this channel, definitely make sure to tag me on LinkedIn, X, or any kind of other platform. I'll be there, and I'm excited to see the changes you've implemented. Finally, let's do a similar thing for share. So I'm going to duplicate this right here below. And instead of bookmark, it can be share and share right here. And that's going to look good. Wonderful. Now we can go one, two, three divs down and we can create one final div. Now we're diving into the class name of product dash info. So here we're really starting to do the gist of the product. What is it for? What is it about? And most importantly, the prices. So let's hop on right in into the product info. Let's create one more div to help us with the layout. And that div is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and a gap of two. Within it, we can render the product price. So let's do a P tag. That's going to render product dot currency. And then we want to render format number, which is coming from utils and then pass the product dot current price into it and close it all properly. That's going to give us $939. We can put this a bit below and we can style it by giving it a class name equal to text dash 34 pixels, text dash secondary and font dash bold. If we save this, that's big. We can duplicate this below. The bottom one can be a bit smaller, like 21, text dash black, opacity dash 50, and we can do line through. Okay, so this is the crossed out price, and this is going to be price currency and then original price. So in case we have a discount, that discount is going to show up right here, crossed out. There we go. In this case, it's the same price. Now we wanna go one div down, and then create one more structure for the number of stars that this product has. Again, something you can implement. We can write different products based on the stars and the number of reviews. Here, we wanna give this div a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and gap of four. Again, to vertically show what we have. Another div that's going to have a class name equal to flex and a gap of three. And within it, a final div that's going to contain the image. And this div is going to have a class name equal to product dash stars. Right within it, we can show our image of, you can guess it, stars. So here we can do a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash star dot SVG. Give it an alt equal to star, a width, let's do about 16 and a height of 16 as well. And that's going to give us this nice star. Right below it, we can render the number of stars. So let's do a P tag and we can render product dot stars. There we go. That's going to be nothing for now. So we can do some kind of a default number, like let's do 25. There we go. We can style this P tag by giving it a class name equal to text dash SM, text dash primary dash orange, and font dash semi bold. And this is going to just make it look more uniform. Finally, we can go one div down. We can create product reviews. So let's create another div that's going to have a class name 
of product reviews. And within it, we can render a new self-closing image tag. And this tag is going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash comment dot SVG. Here we can say alt tag of comment. The width is 16, the height is 16. And as before, we want to render a P tag below it that's going to render the product dot reviews count and then say reviews. If we save it, that's looking good, but we can style this P tag a bit by giving it a class name of text-sm, text-secondary, and font-semi-bold. There we go, that's looking a bit better. Finally, we can go below this P and below two more divs and create another P tag. Within that P tag, we can create a span element that's going to say something like 93% and span of buyers have recommended this. Again, this is something we're hard coding right now, but it would be really cool if you can fetch this and parse it and scrape it directly from Amazon and then implement it right here. So let's do a class name of text-sm, text-black, and opacity of 50. And now we can modify this span by giving it a class name equal to text-primary-green and font-semi-bold. This is just going to make it stand out a bit more. Finally, we can go below two more divs. And now we want to focus on the most important aspect of our application, which are the price cards. So we're going to have four similar cards, which most likely means we're going to have to create another reusable component, right? But first, let's create a div that those cards are going to sit within. That div is going to have a class name equal to margin y of 7 to divide it a bit from top and bottom, flex, flex dash column. So they appear in a column and a gap of 5 to give them some space. After that, we want to give it a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex, gap dash 5, and flex dash wrap. And by the way, guys, once you start writing a lot of UI like this, I can often speed it up. And as you notice right here, I've been going really fast through all of this UI. So let me know if this is too quick for you to actually code out. How do you follow along with these videos? Do you have to pause it and then watch it? Do you just slow me down? Do you speed me up? Is this the right speed? Would you like me to speed up more or slow down? Feel free to let me know down in the comments. Your feedback is truly appreciated. And based off of that, I'll know how to pace myself a bit better for better education. <laughs> Great. So with that said, within here, we can render our first price info card. So let's create a new reusable component called price info card dot TSX. We can run RAFCE and we can import this price info card right here within this div. It's going to be a self-closing component. And to it, we'll have to pass a couple of properties, of course, after importing it. The first property we can pass can be title. And title is going to be current price. We can pass an icon SRC equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash price dash tag dot SVG. We can pass the value, which is going to be the actual dollar amount or any kind of currency amount. So that's a template string of product dot currency. And then after that, format number. And then we pass the product dot current price. So just like that, we can expand this a bit further so we can see it. And then finally, we want to pass the border color since we're going to have multiple. In this case, we can do something like hash B6DBFF. That is this color that you can see right here. It's barely noticeable, but we can also use it for this icon that you see right there, but more on that later. So for now, we're passing all the necessary values and we can go into that price info card and actually make use of the props we are passing. So let's immediately get them. Things such as the title, icon SRC, value, border color, 
And we can define all of these of an interface props, which we can declare right here by saying interface props, and then say we want to get the title of a type string. We want to get an icon src of string, value of string, and border color of string. And now we can start creating this price card. So you can see just price info card. I'm just going to collapse this a bit so you can see it a bit better. There we go. And we want to give this div a class name equal to, let's make a dynamic template string of price dash info underscore card. And then we can say border dash L dash, and then we can pass the border color like so, but it has to be wrapped in square brackets for the color to take effect. What we can do then is instead of simply saying price card, we can render a P tag. And this P tag is going to render the title. So in this case, this is going to be current price, but we can style it further by giving it a class name of text dash base and text dash black dash 100. Okay. And below that, we can render a div. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex and a gap of one to provide some space. And we can render a self-closing image tag with a source equal to icon src, alt equal to title of the card, width of 24, and a height of 24 as well. This is going to give us an image, which we of course have to import first from next image. There we go. We can see it here. And finally, the most important part, which is a P tag that's going to render the actual value. But of course, let's make that a bit bigger by giving it a class name of text-2xl, so much larger, font bold, and text-secondary. There we go. So now this is how it should be. And of course, we now want to reuse this multiple times. So if I go down, I can now duplicate this one, two, three more times and save it. And would you look at that? We immediately have four different cards. But now we actually want to change the values. So in the second one, we want to provide a chart SVG. And it's going to say average price. And also product dot, we want to get the average price as well. Same thing for the third one. We don't want to do price tag. We want to do arrow up. And this is going to be the highest price. So product.highest price. And finally, we have the lowest price. So this is the arrow down. And here we can do product.lowest price. And as you can see, all four of these icons have changed. Let's try to change the border color. For example, for the last one, let's do BEFFC5. And if we click it, nothing changes. So let's see why the card is not taking into effect the color. So let's see, we're doing border dash. And then what if I simply copied this value into here? Usually Tailwind does work like that. You simply say border something, and then you pass the color. And as you can see now, it works. But if I try to do it dynamically, it doesn't actually take effect of the, oh, now it did. Okay, that's interesting. So I had to first pass it manually. What if I now change it for this one? For example, FCC. It's not going to do it. Yeah, so Tailwind sometimes cannot take dynamic values. We really have to work hard to make it happen. It is possible. But in this case, we can just eliminate the border color and keep all four borders as they are. Let's save it. And let's eliminate the border color from all the props right here. And we have a wonderful looking interface. Now the actual value here is the same for all of these different properties because we didn't actually recall our function. Maybe the price has changed up to this point, but we need to recall the same link on our homepage to update the database. Or do we? That's the thing. It wouldn't make sense, right? That you have to manually recall it. If you had to do that, why not just go to Amazon directly and check the price there? The point of this is that soon enough in this video, you're going to implement cron jobs, which means that things are going to happen periodically after some time, which is going to provide a lot of additional functionality to our application. Great. So now we have these below that we want to show a track button. Once you click it, we're going to have some kind of a modal to alert us of the price. 
And then let's just quickly finalize the rest of the things right here. So the modal is going to go two divs down, which is going to be a separate component, but more on that later. And then we want to go two more divs down and we want to focus on the final of the divs, which is going to contain the product description, buy button, and all the other products. So for that, let's create a new div. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and a gap of 16. And just to know what we're working with, let's again do a border of L and then let's do, let's do black. If I save it and go back, you cannot see anything. Let's try border to border red. If I save this, you can see some kind of border, but I need to add 500, right? To make it actually red. There we go. So now you'll be able to see how this div changes as we create new elements within it. The second element is going to be a div with a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and a gap of five. Still nothing because it doesn't have any height. But as soon as we add an H1 within it that renders the product description, you'll see how nicely the elements will fall within it. This H1 is going to have a class name equal to text-2xl and text-secondary, as well as font-semi-bold. There we go. Although it wouldn't be ideal if we call this an H1 because it's not the most important piece of information on the screen. The product name is. So let's just do an H3. Below that, we can render a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and a gap of four. And within it, we want to open a dynamic block of code and say product question mark dot description and then question mark dot split and want to split it by a new line character, which looks like this. So we're going to show all the different rows of a description. In this case, it looks like it didn't pick up too much. It actually pick up uh, just the breadcrumbs. But for some other products, it can pick up actual descriptions. We can play with this later on and scrape it in a better way. Finally, we have a buy now button, which is this. So let's create it. Below the description, we can show our buy now button. So let's go back right here, go two divs below, and right here, we can render a button. This button is going to simply render an image. This image is going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash bag that SVG, and an alt tag of check. It's going to have a width of 22, as well as a height of 22. And if we save it, you should be able to see something right here, but it's currently white, so it's really hard to notice. So what we need to do is add some color to this button by giving it a class name equal to btn w-fit mx auto for margin x flex items dash center justify dash center gap of three and a min width of 200 pixels once we do that we should have a regular looking button and we can also add a link right here within it and this link is going to have an href and it's going to point to forward slash for now. We can also give it a class name equal to text dash base and text dash white. And there we can say something like buy now. We could implement a functionality to even link to multiple websites advertising the same product. This is to make our app even better and then turn it to a paid SaaS product. Finally, the last thing we have to do is just go below the button and below one more div and want to loop over some more products. And to be able to show these products, we have to figure out what are similar products to the product that we're currently viewing. So for that, we'll have to go into our actions, index.ts. We have our scrape and store product, get product by ID, and then get all products. But now we'll want to also do something similar to get all products. So let's simply duplicate it below. And let's call it get similar products. And this function needs to accept a product ID of a type string. Then we need to fetch the current product by saying const 
current product is equal to await product dot find by ID and we pass in the product ID. If we don't have a current product, we return null. And finally, we need to fetch similar products by saying const similar products is equal to await product dot find where we find all of the products where the ID is dollar sign not equal to to the current product ID. And we'll limit it to something like three by saying dot limit of three. And now we can return the similar products that are not going to include the existing one. We can go back and we can use it right here by declaring it at the top of this page. So on top of getting this product, we can also try to get const similar products is equal to await get similar products to which we simply pass the ID. And of course we have to import get similar products from lib actions. Once we do that right here, we can check if similar products exist by saying similar products dot length is greater than zero. And we can add a question mark right here just to be sure that they actually exist. If that is the case, we can say and 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 then render a div. Right now, it's going to complain that similar products is possibly undefined. So first, we need to check if similar products exists in the first place. If it does, then we can check if it's greater than zero. And then if it is, we can show those similar products. So we can wrap everything in a div that has a class name equal to padding y of 14 to provide some space on top and bottom, flex, flex dash call, gap of two, and w of full for full width. We can put a p tag in there and say similar products. And of course, we want to style this a bit by giving it a class name equal to section dash text. And now we should be able to see it somewhere here on the bottom. Although I cannot yet notice it, it seems like we're not getting any similar products back. And of course, this makes sense because this is the only product that we currently have. But nonetheless, let's quickly finalize the similar product section because it's so simple. Let me tell you why. We create this div and that div is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash wrap, gap of 10, margin top of seven, and a W of full. And the only thing we have to do in there is just render similar products dot map where we get each individual product. And what do we return? Well, we return the product card that we have already used on the homepage by importing it from components product card and passing the key equal to product dot underscore ID and passing the product equal to product. And now once we do have some products in the future, they will be shown right here at the bottom. For now, what we can do is remove this red border so we can remove it from here. That's line 157 on my end, border two, border red 500. And with that said, we have a nice looking product details page that looks like this, where we have the description and we have all of the most important details about this product. And we can even visit it right here to get to the location where we originally found it. But of course, this is not the whole point of the application, right? We don't wanna simply sit here. We wanna actually track whether the prices are changing. And for that reason, as I said multiple times so far, we're gonna implement cron jobs, which are essentially functions that are gonna be executed within a specific time frame, allowing us to refetch and refetch new data on demand or on schedule. But before we do that, let's just add another product so we can test if everything is working well with our application. I'm going to go to Amazon, maybe today's deals, and we can select something from here, such as these Jabra Elite 7 earbuds. Here we even have a huge discount. So let me select it and paste the link right here and click search. Something happened. We don't see anything in the console, which means that it's good, I hope. There we go. And now I'm guessing that another product appear right here. And it did. We can see that we have these great earbuds. And if we click them, something breaks. And this is coming from the format number 
because it cannot reach properties of undefined. So it looks like whatever we're passing into the format number is getting right here as undefined. So let's see where are we calling the format within the product details page, just by running a control F. It seems like it's not getting called. Oh no, there we go. It's being called a couple of times. So let's see. Yeah, one of these values is undefined and we need it to be a number. So a cool thing we can do here is instead of simply providing a zero in each one of these cases, we can go to the format number and just set the default value. So we can say right here, num of type number is equal to zero. And this is going to provide it a default value. So it is a number after all. And here you can see we're getting the average price of zero, but that's totally okay. We can get the averages later on once we can actually average something out. For now, what we have is the current price of 79, which is the only thing we're interested in. And I just noticed I didn't change the labels on all of these other ones. So let's see, the first one is the current price. Then the second one is going to be average. The third one is going to be the highest. And the fourth one is going to be the lowest. So if I fix this, now everything should be good. And indeed, the lowest is the current, which means that it's good time to buy. And the highest was 180. And we can keep tracking that to see how it's working. And notice we have similar products in the bottom, and now we can move between those products. How cool is that? So now we know we're properly scraping all the data and let's implement the second most interesting part of our application after of course, all the great scraping, which is going to be cron jobs. So we actually want to recall this from time to time to figure out if the price has actually changed and based off of that, maybe send an information to our email so we know that it's a good time to buy. So our cron jobs are actually going to be sending emails, which is pretty cool. So let's go ahead and implement this model first. This model is right here. We can turn it into a self-closing component and just create it as a new component called model.tsx, run RAFCE, and then import it right here. Great. Now we can close all of the currently open files besides the modal, and we can focus on implementing this great looking modal, which is going to be the last step before we are ready to actually do the cron job. So let's put this to the side. Let's go on one of these products and let's implement this modal right here. To implement the modal, we can first start with a button that's going to trigger it. So let's wrap that button in a React fragment and create it right here by saying button. And this is going to be a button of a type is equal to button. And it's going to have a class name of BTN. And within here, we can simply say track. Now, later on, we're going to give it an on click property. That's actually going to make it work. But for now, we just have this track button. And below it, we want to use something known as a dialog. And this dialog is going to come from something known as headless UI, which is a completely unstyled, fully accessible UI components. And here we can find a dialog. There we go, a modal. And we simply want to use it. We click it, it opens up. So you want to install npm install headless UI react. So you can run it right here. And then here it shows you how to use it. We'll have to import use state and the dialogue at the top and feel free to refer to these docs as well. Since we're using use state, we definitely need to turn this into a use client component. So let's do use client right here. And then we can copy all the code from here. We can first copy the let is open and then the entire dialogue that's right here, which we can paste below the button. Now we can indent it properly. And if we save this, we can implement the on click functionality on this button. So what we want to do is just give this button an on click, which is going to say open modal and we want to create a function const open modal is equal to a simple arrow function that simply sets is open to true. And we can also create another one that's going to be called, I think you can guess it, const close modal set is open to false. So now if we do this and go back, you can see that if we 
click on track, something opens up right here at the bottom, but that's not yet a full active modal. We wanna show it on top of the screen nicely. So to be able to do that, we want to wrap it in something known as a transition. That's going to give it a slow animation of opening. So you wanna copy this entire dialogue and put it within this transition property or element, which is also coming from headless UI React. So you can import it there. You can give it a property of appear. It's gonna show when it is open and it's going to appear as a fragment. This fragment is coming from React. So you can import it at the top. Now, if you save this, still, it's not going to show up on top. That's because we have to say dialogue as div. It's going to show as a div. It doesn't have to have the open property because transition has it, but it will have on close and we can call simply close modal right here. Close modal, which is a function we created. And it's going to have a class name equal to dialogue container. If we save this, you can now see that everything gets darkened and we have some content overlaying the rest of the content. So now we wanna wrap everything in a div. And as a matter of fact, we wanna remove most of this dialogue panel content because we're gonna recreate it by ourselves. So we're gonna start from an empty slate. Within our dialogue, we're gonna have a div. And this div is going to have a class name equal to min-h-screen, padding x of four and text center. This is going to allow us to nicely display our transition children right here. So you can open up a new block saying transition.child and within it, we're gonna render the dialogue.overlay. This is going to help with the actual animation. So we can give it a class name equal to fixed inset zero. So if we save this now, still not a lot happens if we click track, but if we add some additional properties to this child, such as as is equal to fragment, we can do the enter equal to ease out duration of 300. We can also do enter from equal to opacity zero. This is just how headless UI does animations. Enter to opacity 100, leave ease in duration 200, leave from opacity zero and leave to opacity one. So now if we do this and click track, well, we still don't see it, but soon enough, it's going to slowly start to animate in exactly as it does on the finished site. Of course, once the modal is actually done. So now we have this dialogue overlay and we can go below this transition child and create a second transition child, which is going to act as the actual modal. So let's go here and let's create a transition dot child. We can also set it as, as it's going to be a fragment. We can enter of ease out duration 300. We can enter from opacity zero and scale 95. So it's gonna be a bit smaller, but then we're gonna enter to full opacity fully visible and scale 100. Once we leave, we want to ease in duration 200 and want to leave from opacity 100 scale 100 to leave opacity zero scale 95. And within here, we can render a div and that div is going to have a class name equal to dialogue dash content. And if you type test within it, we should be able to already see it. So if I click track, there we go, it slowly appeared and slowly went away. So now let's style the actual modal. Let's add a few divs inside to do the layout of the modal. And we can do that by giving it a class name equal to flex and flex call. We can do another one within it. This one is going to be div with a class name equal to flex and then justify between. And finally, we wanna have one last one, which is going to wrap our image. So this one is going to have a class name equal to p-3 border, border-gray-200 and rounded of 10. And within it, we can render our self-closing image tag. And this is simply going to be for the logo. So we can say source, 
forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash logo dot SVG. Alt is going to be logo. Width is going to be something like 28 and height is going to be 28 as well. And we can import image coming from next image. If we do this and save, you can see our price logo, which is good. But now why is this not centered in the middle of the screen? Well, with headless UI, there's a little trick that you can use to center the modal contents. So above this transition child right here, you can do a span element. This span element for now can render just a string of test, but what matters more is what it's going to have within it. It's going to have a class name equal to inline dash block h dash screen, so full height and align middle. And also a area of hidden is set to true. Okay, let me test it one more time. So I'm gonna click test and now it actually works. I don't think we need this test within it. I think we can just put the automatic close. So it's just a span that has the align middle within it. And if I do that, it is nicely centered. So now let's start adding stuff into it. So right here next to this image where we have the logo, below the div containing it, we wanna add an image that's about to close this model. So we can add a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash x dash close dot SVG with an alt tag of close, a width of about 24, a height of 24, a class name equal to cursor dash pointer. So we know it's clickable and an on click property of close modal. So now we can actually close it. We can open it. We can also click outside to close it. It's looking good. Now below this div, we want to show an H4. And this H4 is going to say something like, let's copy it from the finished site, stay updated with product pricing alerts right in your inbox, something like this. And again, you can visit the deployed link. It's going to be pricewise 10vercelapp Below this H4, we're going to also have a P tag. And this P tag can say something like never miss a bargain again with our timely alerts. We can paste that content within it as well. Finally, below this div containing the P tag, we're going to have a form element that's going to have a class name equal to. Before we add that, let's go back to our current website. We can give it a flex flex dash call an MT of five to divide it a bit from the content. And we can give it a label. This label is going to be an HTML for email. So here we'll be able to enter our email and let's give it a class name of text dash SM font dash medium text dash gray dash 700. And there we can simply say email address. So if we save this, you can see email address. And of course we have to add an input below. So let's first create an input container by wrapping it in a div with a class name equal to dialogue dash input underscore container. And it's going to have a self-closing image for search. So we can say something like source is equal to forward slash assets forward slash icons forward slash mail dot SVG. It's going to be an alt of mail with a width of about 18 pixels and a height of 18 pixels as well. If we save it, you can see it appear right there. And then we need to add an actual input, which is going to be required. It's going to be of a type is equal to email of an ID equal to email. It's going to have a placeholder. You can put something like enter your email address and a class name equal to dialogue dash input. Let's see how does that look like? Okay, this is great. And below this div, we can create a button that's going to submit it all. So it's going to be a button with a type is equal to submit. And it's going to have a class name equal to dialogue dash BTN. Finally, it can say track. Okay, this is looking good. Everything besides these text elements. So we can go up 
the H4 can have a class name equal to dialog dash head underscore text. And the P tag can have a class name equal to text dash SM text dash gray dash 600 and a margin top of two. If we save it, we have a great looking modal right here. And the last thing is to implement the form and the functionality to actually be able to do something with this email. So what we can do is create a couple of use state fields. We already have is open. We're going to need one for the loading state, which we can call is submitting set is submitting at the start set to false. And we need one for the input. So we can say use state and we can call that email set email at the start set to an empty string. And finally, we'll need a const handle submit function, which is going to be an async function, just like so. So now we can actually call these within our elements. Let's go down. Let's first deal with our form. The form is going to have an on click or rather on submit is going to be handle submit. So we can call this function. But now our input is going to have a value equal to email. And on change, we simply want to get an event and we want to set email to be equal to e target value, which is the value that the user has typed into this input. So now we can actually update this. And the key question is what happens once we click track? And this brings us all the way to the submit. If we are currently submitting, we don't want to say track. So we want to check that. If is submitting, we can say submitting, else we can say track. Once we click it, this is going to trigger the handle submit function, which is right here. So how is that functionality going to look like to actually send a real email and then keep track of the updates? Let's do it one step at a time. First thing is we're getting a submit event right here. So we can say event is of a type form event coming from react. Specifically, it's an HTML form element. And we can define that as its own type like here. Once we do that, we can say e dot prevent default as we don't want to reload the page and set is submitting to true. And then we'll want to call a function that's going to add user email to product. So what does this mean? It means we want to update our user about a specific product. And to this function, we'll have to pass the product ID and the email of the user. Okay. And this is going to be an asynchronous function. So we have to add a weight in there. Finally, after we call it, we want to set is submitting to false. We're not submitting anymore. We want to reset the email as well to empty. And finally, we want to call the close modal. So now if we do this, if we enter a valid email address, such as ASD at gmail.com and click track, it's just going to close. But now it's our turn to actually implement one, I believe, final action in our course, in our application, which is add user email to product. So let's go to our lib actions and below scrape and store product and below all of these other ones we can create a final export async function, add user email to product, which accepts a product ID of a type string, as well as a user email of a type string. And in here, we can open up a try and catch block as we usually do. In the catch, we're gonna simply console log the error, but in here, we wanna actually send out our first email. So let's say send our first email, which is exactly what we can do next. Inside of here, we wanna check for which product are we trying to send the email. So we need to get the product by saying const product is equal to await product.findById and we pass the product ID. Then we check if there is no product, we simply exit out of the function. Then we need to check for the user if the user already exists on the list of the users that are tracking that product. So we can say const user exists is equal to product.users.sum and then user of a type user, 
which has to be imported from types, and if user.email is triple equal to user email. If that is the case, the user exists. So then what we can say if no user exists, then we can simply run product.users.push and we pass the email where it's equal to the user email. We save that product by saying await product.save and then we generate the email contents by saying const email content is equal to generate email body where we pass the product and then this is going to be of a type welcome. Finally, we have to create this function that's going to generate the email body. So let's create a new folder within the lib, which is going to be called node mailer. And within it, we can create a new index.ts. Within it, we can first import something known as node mailer coming from node mailer. And of course, this is a package that we have to install by running npm install node mailer which we're gonna use for sending emails from our Next.js application. Then we wanna export const notification type. So just notification is equal to, and we can have four different ones. It can be welcome, of a type welcome. It can be a change of stock as well, which is going to be change of stock. It can be lowest price. So the change in the lowest price, which is going to be lowest price and then threshold met. This is when the threshold is met, when the price drops below a specific level. So these are just variables that are gonna indicate four different types of emails that we can send. And then we can create a function, export const generate email body is equal to a function that accepts two things. It accepts the product, which is the email product info, as well as the type which is going to be the notification type right here. And that's coming from add four slash types. Now that we have that, we can start preparing the content, which we can send via email. So first we can get a shortened title by saying const shortened title is equal to if product.title.length is greater than 20 characters, then we can say product.title.substring of zero to 20 and then dot, 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 because it is too long. Else, we can simply render the product.title. We can also declare a subject of the email as an empty string, and then the body of the email as an empty string as well. And then we can open up a new switch clause where we get a different type of the email we wanna send. It can be one of these four. And if the type is notification.welcome, which is the first one we're sending, then we wanna declare a subject right here is equal to something. For example, welcome to price tracker and body is equal to a template string where we also add something in there. And this can be HTML, something like welcome to price tracker and so on. Finally, we need to break and we need to repeat this four different times for four different emails for the change of stock, lowest price and so on. And actually, I generated all of these using ChatGPT. So right below, you'll be able to find this entire generate email body function in the GitHub just down below. You can copy it and simply override the one that we currently have. Everything else is going to be the same, but here you'll just notice that we have the case for the change of stock, for the lowest price, for the threshold met, and then also for the notification welcome where we send the title and then we send some generated HTML that talks a bit about the product. This is it. And for this one, threshold met, we'll also need to define this threshold percentage, which at the top we can define as export const threshold met of about 40. So if it drops 40% down, then we can do it. And also threshold percentage, it looks like I misspelled it. This is how it's gonna look like, great. So now we have our generate email body function and we're importing node mailer. Let's just see if it's installed. It seems like it cannot find it, but it was installed indeed, node mailer. Okay, we'll see what that's about really soon. For now, we can go back and we can actually import the generate email body function from node mailer. This is going to provide us with the email contents based on the type of the email, such as welcome, 
And then most importantly, we have to run a wait, send email, where we pass in the email content. And then in the second parameter, inside of an array, we pass the user email, just like so. And now we can get into the node mailer file and create a new function, export const send email is equal to an async function like so. And we can get the things that we pass in such as the email content of a type email content, which is coming from add forward slash types, as well as a send to, which is going to be a array of strings. So we can say string array like so. Now inside of here, we can declare some email options. So we can say const mail options is equal to an object where we have from, so who are we sending from? We're gonna get this from environment variables soon enough. We have the two, who are we sending to? And we know that already. It's gonna be an array of send to. Then we have the HTML, which is going to be the email content dot body. And then we have the subject, which is going to be the email content dot subject. So we're missing only one single thing. Who are we sending it from? And for that, we have to define the method of transfer. So right here above the send email, we can say const transporter is equal to node mailer dot create transport. And we pass in an object. We have to define a pool, which we're gonna say is equal to true. And if you wanna learn more about these options, you can go to the node mailer documentation. And here you can learn more about the SMTP email transfer. So it's a protocol for sending emails. And then here you can define different options, the pool configuration and more, the port, host, auth, and the auth method. And we're gonna need all of these things to make this work. I tried to find the simplest service to use and believe it or not, the service of Hotmail is much simpler to use for such transfers than Gmail. Gmail has a lot of security privileges that you have to go through. Then we have to have the port of 2525. We have to have the auth. And then here you'll have to pass your user as well as your pass, which I'm gonna teach you how to create really soon. And then we can define the number of max connections, which is for now going to be one. So now we have almost everything ready to send our email besides who are we sending it from and the auth of our node mailer SMTP account. So let's make that happen. Here immediately in node mailer documentation, we have the using Gmail article that says that even though Gmail is the fastest way to get started with sending emails, it is by no means a preferable solution unless you're using the OAuth2 authentication. Gmail expects the user to be an actual user, not a robot, so it's really hard to make that work. So for that reason, we can just set up Node Mailer using Hotmail. So here, you can just figure out how to do that. There are many different articles, but of course, I'm gonna teach you how to do it in this video. The only thing we need to do is get these credentials from auth, user, and password. And you can get to those by creating an Outlook account. I know, I know who uses Outlook, but in this case, we'll need to get it to be able to automate the process of sending emails. And by the way, no hard feelings if you are an Outlook user. So let's go ahead and create a free account. You can choose a new email. I'm gonna do jsmastery at outlook.com. Okay, that already exists. Somebody's trying to steal our identity. I'm gonna try JavaScript mastery in this case. And then you can create a password. Once you log in, I believe this is it. You'll have a new Outlook account, which you definitely didn't sign up for when watching this video, but now you can actually use it right here within the auth of the Hotmail. So here in the auth and the from, you can add your exact email. So this is going to be your email account. So if we go to my profile, I believe we'll be able to see it. There we go, JavaScriptMastery at Outlook.com. So we can add that here and here. And then we have to add the password. And of course, this is going to be hidden. So here we need to do a process.env dot, and then let's do email underscore password. Now, of course, I'm not gonna show you my password, but what you can do is go to env, which is right here, and add an email underscore password is equal to, to the password you use to create your account. No, it's not one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three in this case. So add it 
and we'll be right back. There we go. Now we have everything we need to establish or initialize a transporter. And we can use the transporter when paired with mail options to actually make an email transport. So right here below the mail options, we can say transporter dot send email where we pass in the mail options we created. And here we pass a callback function that has the error of a type any and the info of a type any. And then here, if there's an error, we can simply console log it by saying return console.log error. And else we can simply do a console log email sent and then with the response or in this case, the info. So this is great and this should actually work. So we are ready to give it a shot. You might need to reload your terminal just for the changes in the .env to take effect. So press control C and then Y and then rerun it. And now we can actually call the send email by importing it from node mailer and calling it within our add user email to product. This should now initialize the sequence of sending a welcome email. So we can collapse this function and we can actually give it a shot because this add user email to product should be called right here within our modal. So we can uncomment it and we can import it coming from lib actions. And the product ID has to be passed as a prop to our modal. So here we can get the product ID, which is going to be of a type props. And then we can define the interface of props is going to contain the product ID of a type string. And we of course need to pass that when calling the modal. So we can see where we're calling the modal, which is within the page here. And we can say product ID is equal to just ID, just like so. There we go. And now it's not gonna complain because it's getting exactly what it wants. At least I hope, there we go, we're good. And now we're calling the add email right here when clicking this thing. So what do you say that we give it a shot? We can go back to our application right here. We can reload it just to ensure everything is good. You can enter your email address. I'm gonna do javascriptmastery00 at gmail.com and you can click track. It's gonna submit it and close the modal. Once we do that, you can check if there are any errors in the console. Everything seems to be good here. And in the network tab, there's nothing there. So everything seems to have went okay, but we do have an error right here. Transporter.sendEmail is not a function. And this is happening at send email. So let's see, we go to our add user email to product, and then we go into our send email. And it's saying that transporter.sendEmail is not a function. We're defining the transporter here by saying node mailer.create transport. But as we saw, it is complaining that the node mailer does not exist, even though we installed it in package.json. So let's check it out. We have node mailer right here. It is possible that Next.js is getting stricter with its rules, and node mailer is strictly a backend package. So doing some reading right here, it is apparent that we can only use this on the server, right? So what we might wanna do is define this entire file as use server. So what we can do then is if you save it, you'll see that we get a warning or an error here saying that only async functions are allowed here. So we need to turn this generate email body to an async function and we can remove the return here because we know what async functions return, they return a promise. So now whenever we call this generate email body, such as right here, we have to do an await beforehand. And now the email content is good. And now if we save this, the error should go away because we have all async functions, such as the generate email body and the async send email. But the threshold percentage still is not async. I'm gonna simply put it as a variable within the generate email body function. So right here, and it can be just a constant const threshold percentage right here. Now, if we save this, let's see, do we have any other warnings or errors? A use server file can only export async functions found object. So yeah, we have this object, but we don't necessarily need to export it. It can just be a regular object. And there we go, we're back on track. Now, what if we try it one more time? What if I try entering a JavaScript mastery email and open up the console right here? 
I'll try to give it a shot and run track. And no error yet. Do we have something here? No errors in the console. No errors here either. Network is looking fine and this is looking fine as well. Okay, so we didn't get that error. And if we reopen the file right here, node mailer, yeah, it's still giving the warning right here for type, but it is possible that the function went through. So the next thing we can do is expect that the email is going to arrive to our mailbox. So this means that we have no errors, but unfortunately we also didn't get an email. So let's do some further digging. First, we can try to resolve this smaller issue of a type error, and that can be solved by installing a dev dependency. So we can go to our terminal and run npm install dash dash save dash dev, and we can do at types forward slash node mailer. So if we're using TypeScript, it's good to know our node and Next.js application know that we'll be using these specific types for node mailer. So this is going to get added within your package.json as a dev dependency right here. Once it gets there, our application is going to know what this is and it's not going to complain, which is great. Now, one thing I noticed is that here, if we use a send email, it's going to say that property send email does not exist on transporter sent message. It says send mail. And again, this is another huge, huge benefit of TypeScript. As soon as we install those built-in types, as you can see, we can notice that this does not exist. It's, did you mean send mail? So right here, we can just do send mail. And now hopefully this will go through. So let's go ahead and just type our email one more time. I'm gonna do JavaScript mastery and I'm gonna click track. But unfortunately, I still didn't get any email, nor did we get any information in the console. So one thing that I thought of right now is that we used the previous email that we had this when this was wrong. And then we added the new user right here, but then the second time it's not going to add it because it's already there. So what we need to do is now just for test purposes, we need to send it to another email. Usually it's gonna work for everybody. So what we can do is right now, just go here and enter an email that you haven't entered so far. In this case, I'm gonna do contact at jsmastery.pro. I'm gonna open up the console and I'm gonna click track. If we do this, now I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom and you can see from JavaScript mastery at outlook.com to contact at jsmastery.pro. This is great. So far, this is looking good. And now the last thing we have to do is wait for an email. And not too much has passed. And I've gotten the email right here within our inbox from JavaScript mastery at outlook.com. Now, one thing I wanna mention is that it was under spam. So you might wanna check your spam folder and move it to your inbox. But here's how the email looks like. Welcome to PriceWise. You're now tracking Apple 2022 MacBook Air. And then here's an example of how you'll receive updates. And then here we say, you know, the price has lowered or the product is now back in stock. Don't miss the chance and buy it. So this is pretty cool. It's a real application that sends you emails. So with that said, we can now put this to the side, close our email provider, go back to the application and implement the last part of the application, which is ensuring that these emails are happening periodically and that the bright data scraping happens periodically as well so that we can be alerted on time. So let's do that next. We have this send email updated. We have our actions. Everything here is looking good. But now that we have added a user email to product indicating their interest, how do we figure out when to send it or how to do any of that stuff? Let's close all of the currently open files and let's start fresh. To get started with implementing our cron functionalities, believe it or not, all the code associated with that will be within one file or to be more precise within a single API route. So within our app folder, we can create a new API folder and create a new route called cron. And within it, we can create a new file called route.ts. And all of the logic is going to be within here which is pretty exciting as this part of the code is gonna utilize 
everything we've done so far. It's gonna scrape the product, it's going to do that periodically, it's going to modify and call our database and do all sorts of other things, but all of that is gonna happen within this single API route. So to implement it, we can say export async function get, as it's going to be a get request, and then we can open up a new try and catch block. Within the catch, we can simply throw a new error, and we can say something like failed, to get old products or error in get and then console log that error. If we are in the try though, we first need to connect to our database as we usually do from our server actions. So we can say connect to DB, import that from add forward slash libmongoose, and then we can try to fetch all of our products by saying cons products is equal to await product dot find. And then we can pass just an empty object means find all of them and we can import product from lib product models. Then we can say if there is no products, then we can simply throw a new error saying no products found. But now we start with the first step of our cron job, which is one scrape latest product details and update DB. There we go. I can code better than I can type, apparently, <laughs> but we got through that sentence. So let's scrape all the products. How do we do that? Well, we can say const updated products is equal to await, and we're gonna create a promise dot all. That's because within it, we're gonna call multiple asynchronous actions at the same time. Yes, we're gonna access and update all the products in our database at the same time. So we can say products dot map, where we get an asynchronous function, callback function, that's going to get the current product. And then within here, we wanna scrape that individual product. So we're not gonna do this on a per product basis, rather we're gonna map over all of our existing products. So let's say const scrape product is equal to await, and we're gonna call the function we have already created called scrape Amazon product coming from libscraper. So you need to import it and pass the current product dot URL. And I'm gonna expand this a bit further so you can see everything in one line. There we go. Then we can do a simple check. If there is no scrape product, we can throw a new error, no product found. Else we wanna update that product's history. So we can say const updated price history is equal to an array. And now if you remember correctly, we were already dealing with price history before. So we can search for price history and you can see that we're calling it right here between this lib file, I believe. There we go, product and we have update price history. So we wanna do exactly the same thing as we're doing here, updated price history. And then we also wanna update the product in our database as well. So all of these things from line 44 on my end to 26, from updated price history to updating the product and then to updating the product in the database, we can copy that, get back here and just put it below this if check. So we can say const, we can call it updated price history, no need for a type right here. We can get the current product in this case, we called it current product dot price history and then update the new scrape product that current price. Then we wanna redeclare the product object by saying const product is equal to, we spread the current scrape product and then we update all the prices. So in this case, we need to import all of these functions from libutils by double clicking them and then pressing control or command space. This is the fastest way to do it. And now we have this new product, which we need to use to update this in the database. So here we have one extra curly brace so we can remove it. We can indent this properly and we say const updated product is equal to await product that find one and update based off of the URL, we pass the new product and we don't have to create them from scratch here because we know they already exist. And then we have to figure out what are we closing here? Do we really wanna exit out of the map right here? Well, not yet. So we're still right here below this updated product and we're diving into the second step, which is two check each product's status and send email accordingly, okay? 
I know this is getting a bit complicated. We are essentially just scraping again the products we already have in our database, updating the database, and now we wanna check the product status. Has the price lowered? Is maybe the product back in stock? And so on. So let's declare a new const email notif as a notification type is equal to get email notif type. And then we wanna pass the scraped product and the current product. So we can know what has changed. And then this get email notif, it's gonna come from a utils. It's the one that we commented out before. So now we can uncomment it. And now we have the notification, we have threshold percentage, and we can ensure that nothing here is red. So here it's saying the lowest price does not exist on type, new title storing options. Let's see what this is about. So here we have our notification, which we have to import at the top. Yes, that was a thing. Before we didn't have these, now we do. So now maybe instead of importing these, as we converted our function into a server action, so we can no longer export these, maybe we just get in there and copy this notification right here. So we can paste it right here at the top of this call. We no longer need to import it. And then we have the threshold percentage, which is in the node mailer. So let's go into the node mailer file. And then we have defined it, I believe within this function right here. So we can simply copy it, go back, remove the import, and then put it here as well. So now we can easily use all of these within the function and nobody is complaining. So now we can go back within our route and we can import get email notif type. I'm gonna expand this a bit further and you can see it complains about the scrape product, which is happening right here. It's saying that the argument type of this is not assignable to parameter of type product. That's because it says that we're missing the average price and is out of stock. So if we look into the return of our scrape Amazon product function and scroll down, you can see that indeed we misspelled is out of stock. We have a capital F here, which we have to fix. And what is it with the average price? Yes, this was supposed to be average price, not just average. So if we fix this, I believe we're gonna be good to go. Yep, once again, thank you TypeScript for noticing this. This can take you hours and hours to notice if you weren't using TypeScript. Now that we have this get email notification, we're gonna know which kind of notification we have to send. So what we can do then is say, if email notification type exists, and this is important if updated product.users.length is greater than zero, meaning if there's somebody to update, then we wanna get the current product info by saying const product info is equal to an object where we have the title equal to updated product.title and URL equal to updated product.url. Then we want to construct the email content by saying const email content is equal to generate email body. Again, using another function which we have created, passing the product info and the email notification type. Finally, we wanna get an array of user emails to which that we need to send the emails to. So const user emails is equal to updated product.users.map where we get each individual user and we do a check. User, and then we can define user as a type. In this case, we can just use any and then simply return all user emails. Now we have an array of all user emails we need to send emails to. So what do we do? Well, we call await send email, which is a function that we have to import from lib node mailer. And then we define the email content we wanna send and user emails we want to send it to. And with that, it's so easy. And the email content, once again, thank you TypeScript, returns a promise because we made it into an async function. So we have to add an await right here for this to work. Pretty cool stuff. So now we are actually sending an email. We're gonna go one div below and then simply return the updated product as well. With that, we wanna go all the way above the catch and return a next response dot JSON where we simply pass a message is set to okay, and we can pass data set equal to updated 
products. And this next response is coming from next server. So this is it. I understand that this was a bit tougher, that we had to incorporate all the functions we have built so far in this video into this single cron job. And that's usually what cron jobs do, not any new logic, but the logic you have already created by following a specific period. So once again, we connect to the database, we find all products, we re-scrape all the products by doing scrape Amazon product, we update their price history and the current prices, then we check if a notification has to be sent. Maybe they're back in stock, maybe the price dropped below a threshold, anything like that. We find all users that subscribed to the changes in those products, and then we simply send emails to all of them. This is it. So now we have our cron route and we can actually deploy our application, which is then going to expose our API route online so we can call it periodically. I'm gonna show you how to do that as well. So the next thing we have to do is simply deploy the application. So I'm gonna close all of the currently open files, collapse the folders and go to our terminal. So right here, go to view and then terminal and we can stop it from running and close the other terminal, which we won't need anymore and clear it. So how do you deploy modern Next.js 13 applications with scraping and crons? Well, you deploy them with Vercel. Vercel, of course, being the creator of Next.js, of course, it's gonna be the simplest and best to deploy it right with them. So go to vercel.com, click start deploying, and then you'll be greeted with all the projects you have created before once you log in to your dashboard. As you can see, I have a lot of projects right here. We have rebuilt our entire JS Mastery Pro platform right here, but then also we have many of the team projects and cohort projects from our JSM Masterclass experience. All of these projects are production ready and are deployed on Vercel as they're using the latest and greatest of Next.js 13 technologies. So the entire JS Mastery Pro website, alongside the Masterclass page, which you can visit in case you wanna learn more about it, is built using Next.js and deployed on Vercel. So to deploy your application, you can go to add new and then go to project. But before it appears right here, we'll have to push the code to GitHub. So simply go to github.com forward slash new. And right here, you can say price wise. And then you can make it either public or private and then click create a repository. Now you can put this side by side with your current code editor, and then we can start copying commands one by one. The first command is git init. But before you do that, please add the dot local to your dot env. This is going to ensure that it doesn't get published on the internet. Then you can run git init, git add dot, git commit dash m first commit, git branch m main, git remote add origin, and then finally git push u origin master. This is the only thing it takes to publish all of your code right here on GitHub in a matter of seconds. And you can see it is there. Now that it is, we can go to Vercel, and you can see just now the latest version of PriceWise is there, so you can click import. Now inside of here, you can play with the name a bit, and then you have to add your environment variables. So what you can do is just go back to your .env.local, copy everything from there. And when I say copy everything, I literally mean it. Just press Control or Command A and copy it. Go back and then simply paste it right here. Vercel's magic is automatically going to copy all of the keys and the values separately. Once you do that, you can press deploy and wait for the magic to happen. Now, usually deployments don't go right on the first try. So we might need to come back and fix something in the code, which is totally okay. It's just important that we get this first deployment out of the way. So let's wait for the build and then we can fix a couple of TypeScript errors if there are any. And unfortunately I was right. We do have some build errors. So right here we see that Module not found can resolve support scholars. Okay, that's interesting. Another error happened while pre-rendering the API cron page. Okay, and then this is it. And here it broke while reading the price. So let's go ahead and fix those together. The support scholar one is a bit weird, but it happens. Sometimes one of our packages requires some other packages to be in there. So doing a quick Google search and just figuring out Next.js 13 can't resolve support scholar, 
The first answer is to just install it. So we're gonna do that right now, just to go through with the deployment. That's one change we have to make. And then another one is figuring out what is the price error in the cron route. So right here, let's search for dot price. Here we have the price history, not really price. So let's just reread the error. It's saying cannot pre-rendered because it cannot read properties of undefined reading price. Okay. And we don't really get a line number right here. So let's just search for price and let's just close it right here. So there's just one instance of price like this. But if we go forward, we can see price history, lowest, highest, and more, but not really just price, right? And here we just declare it as a key. So this is not really a place where it should break. Regarding this price, let's go back a bit and check it out. So here, let's see. One thing that I noticed is right here under update product, we're saying scrape product.url, but we need to get the product.url. So this is just a tiny mistake on my end. But besides that, there's one more important thing we have to do, which is also a great lesson on its own. Alongside every single API route, Next.js allows you to export a couple of different functions that are gonna modify the way that this function or API route opens. So we can say export const max duration. And that max duration here is going to be set to 300. This is not milliseconds, this is seconds. So that's a couple of minutes right here. I think even GitHub Copilot told me it's five minutes. So it cannot go over that. We can also set export const dynamic is set to force dynamic. And in case you wanna read more about different execution modes, you can simply Google different file conventions and route segment configs. And here you can see dynamic, auto, force dynamic, and more. And then you can read what other options can you pass to it. Here, you can read more about different options. For example, force dynamic is going to force dynamic rendering and uncached data fetching of layout or page by disabling all caching of fetch requests and always revalidating. Okay, pretty cool. And then we wanna also set a revalidate to zero. That's the last option. Export const revalidate is equal to zero. Hopefully these couple of fixes and the installation of our support scholars is going to make it work. So let's simply run git add, git commit dash M, let's say fix build errors, and let's simply run git push. Now we don't have to go through the entire process of Vercel. Simply, you can visit your repository or your dashboard, go to the last project and go to deployments. And you're gonna notice that the second deployment is now running and we can wait to see if it's gonna be an error or if it's gonna be successful. And there we go, we are ready. So now if you go to the latest deployment and you click visit, you can see that we are now live and we have our latest two products because this is connected to the same database we were connected to before. Just to ensure that everything works all right, let's try another Amazon product. I'm gonna grab another one of Amazon's deals and let's go for this Philips 3000 series air fryer. It's also at a great discount, so I'm gonna copy it, go to our now deployed price wise right here, and then enter the product link and click search. After searching, it's going to add it right here at the bottom, you can implement a redirect, but we can also simply click right here. Immediately, a new model opens up in case you wanna be alerted about these products updates. But even right now, you can see it's a great deal because it is discounted from 180 to 79. And then here we have the description, the buy link and similar products. But of course, we don't wanna click track yet because even though we did implement the cron function or the API route, which we exposed that we can call, we didn't yet implement a cron job or a timeline when it can be ran. But now I wanna show you a guide that Vercel themselves wrote on how to set up cron jobs on Vercel. And as I said before, cron jobs are time-based scheduling tools used to automate repetitive tasks. By using a specific syntax called a cron expression, you can define the frequency and timing of each task. This helps improve efficiency and ensures that important processes are performed consistently. And Vercel supports cron jobs for serverless and edge functions. 
and here you can learn how to implement it. Although it's easy to set up, it's difficult testing their cron functions as they only run once a day in production. And as an alternative, we found cron-job.org. It's completely free and you can easily adjust the cron schedule. So no need to learn how to compute it. And they also have logs. So the only thing you have to do is create an account. And it looks like they still use the older version of Material UI. I would remember this anytime. I'm sure they're gonna switch the Tailwind really soon. And after creating an account, you simply have to verify your email address. And once you do that, you can sign in. Once you're in, you'll be able to see this, zero enabled cron jobs. So let's simply create our first one. We can first give it a title, such as price-wise. We can give it a URL. And let's go to our current version of the application, but not this specific deployment. You wanna go all the way to Vercel, to your projects, price-wise JSM, and then you wanna visit here and not any specific deployment. This is going to give you a clean URL for all the updates on your latest branch. So now take that and paste it right here. But we wanna append forward slash API forward slash cron. So this is the URL or the endpoint where we had that cron function. We can click enable job and then the execution timeline for now can be every two minutes. You can do this just for testing in case you wanna play with it but usually you can do it maybe every day at a specific time. So maybe every day before you wake up at let's say 7 a.m., this looks good to me. And then that's when it's going to run. For testing, in case you wanna play with it, you can also do every two minutes. Then you can also schedule an expiration. For now, I'm gonna do it on the 1st of October, but this is 1st October of 2024, which is in about a year, but that's okay with me. And believe it or not, that's it. You can now click create or you can click test run. So let's click test run. And you can see, do you wanna start a test run for the current job settings, including any unsaved changes? We'll execute your request immediately and display the results. So let's click start test run. This is going to wait for the response. And we got an internal error of 500. One thing that you can do to debug this is go to our Vercel, which is right here, and then go to logs. So right here, you should be able to see different logs and why the errors are happening. So we can see that the API cron failed with a status of 500. And if you open up the second one, you'll actually be able to see the error. And we get the same one. Error, get, cannot read properties of undefined reading price. And once again, we don't have any more useful information about the line number or anything like that. The only thing we know is that it cannot read properties of undefined reading price. So this is the last thing we'll have to debug. It is possible that we have a typo somewhere in our cron route. That wouldn't be hard to imagine as this is a long file where we had a lot of different scrape products, updated products, and more. So with that in mind, in the GitHub just down below, there's going to be the updated route.ts file, which you can simply copy and then override right here. Doing that will most likely eliminate that little typo we had, and hopefully the price is not going to be undefined. So let's go ahead and just add that change by saying git add dot git commit dash m, let's say fix error, and then git push. Finally, let's wait until this is pushed to main, which we can know by going to deployments and then waiting for the deployment to finish. And once our deployment is live, we can revisit our live deployed website and we can run another track request. And let's try with another email address just to be sure. I'll try with this long JSM masterclass experience at gmail.com one to see if it works and click track. This is going to submit the request and then we can go back to our Vercel, go to logs and we can track to see if we get a 500 or if it works. So here we can switch this to live and hopefully we're gonna see a cron request come in or rather we can call it directly through our cron job. And I'm gonna click test run one more time and let's start a test run. Now we can go back to our logs and hopefully wait for a successful log. There we go, API cron MongoDB connected and is it gonna be a 200 or a 500? It looks like API cron gave us a 200. If we go back right here to get cron, there we go. 
it succeeded. So it was a typo right there. But thankfully, it went through. We can see more information about the product here. And then message, OK. This is what matters the most. So now that we know that it is working, we can actually create this cron job. And believe it or not, this is it. It's going to automatically execute it at 7 a.m. tomorrow, or at least that's how I have set it up. And then you can go to status pages or even dashboard. And here you'll be able to see all of your events that have ran based on a specific cron schedule. In case you want to test it a bit, you can also go here, edit it, and then do something like every one minute. In that case, it should just happen immediately in a minute, and then we'll be able to see it in the event dashboard. So let's wait for that and see if it works. And as you can see, cron jobs are being executed as they should, and we're getting emails. So just so it doesn't happen every two minutes, I'm gonna go to cron jobs, edit, and then I'm gonna put it every day at 7 a.m. There we go, and I'm gonna click save. With that said, we've came to the end of this amazing video. The application has now been fully built. You can track any kind of an Amazon product immediately and then get its current price, average price, highest and lowest price, as well as read more details and see similar products. Of course, all of this is being powered by Bright Data that allows us to scrape the data, and then we can track those scrapings using cron jobs. So it's been quite an exciting project. Although it looks simple, there's so much stuff happening on the back end, and now you know all of the concepts needed to make things work. So once again, huge thanks to Bright Data, not only for sponsoring this video, but also for making such a phenomenal tool, allowing us to scrape anything, anywhere, without any blockers. And if you like this video, you'll surely like what we do on JSMastery.pro. In case you want to become a master Next.js 13 developer, take our flagship Next.js 13 course where you build an entire modern Stack Overflow clone application. Or if you're really serious about your development career, check out the JSM Masterclass experience. With that said, thank you so much for watching this video and have a wonderful day.